Madam President and members, I have before you Senate File 1. Um, one of the things that we have all learned in the past few months is how important health coverage is to the people of Minnesota. And so uh, with help from everyone in committees the last few days, we have moved this bill to this place in a very expeditious manner. And I want to thank everyone who participated. Um, this is the beginning of a session of reforms. Many parts of this conversation are going to happen over these next few months. But first, urgently, we will address relief, access, and reform. Other actions that we will look at? What happens with Minsher in an era of ACA change? We'll look at consumer reforms, such as surprise billing, any willing provider, network adequacy, and many other good bipartisan ideas that will be brought forth by people from both sides of the aisle. And we look forward to that conversation. Today, in Senate File 1, we are, we are addressing a particular crisis. In July of 2016, Blue Cross Blue Shield left the individual market. And many of us knew at that moment there was a foundational problem in our insurance structure. Our friends, neighbors, local businesses, and even family members have had to make the choice whether to pay insurance or their mortgage to close their businesses or try a little longer to pay for private insurance. Many in this group impacted are not eligible for federal tax credits. And in late October, Governor Dayton proposed $300 million in premium relief. Many supported that idea at that time, but for many reasons it did not move forward. But there is general agreement to help. But the people of Minnesota expect that if we're going to spend $300 million on a problem, we should address some of the underlying issues that led to that problem. So in Senate File 1, we address four problems, premium increases, sudden loss of coverage, uncertainty and instability in the insurance market, and a lack of options, particularly in greater Minnesota. Actions we are taking in this bill, direct premium relief, continuing care for sudden loss of coverage, and reinsurance to stabilize the market. We also provide an innovative ag co-op health plan and some small employer reforms to help meet some of the pressing needs in greater Minnesota. Now members, to the bill. In Article 1, we address premium assistance. Our provision asks that only those who apply for the help would get the help. We implement means testing and we have graduated premium relief. Our focus is on those who are most in need. We also include an audit and recovery of funds if they are inappropriately applied to premium relief. The funds in this provision come from our reserves and unspent funds will return to the reserves. And Madam President and members, if you turn to page four, you'll see the means testing that we have outlined. Uh, beginning at 300% of the Federal Poverty Guideline and going to 800% of the Federal Poverty Guideline. With step support at each of those levels, we believe that this graduated relief is more effective in helping Minnesotans than other proposals that we may have seen. Um, Madam President and members, I think it's significant that we are transferring over $300 million out of the reserve fund. It is a reflection of and an acknowledgement that we are in a crisis and we, our reserves exist for rainy days. And as one of our colleagues in the House said, it's raining for a lot of Minnesotans and so appropriately we're using rainy day funds. As we move to Article 2 in the bill, we begin market reforms. Remember, this is just the beginning. We start with a timely disclosure of rates on page 7, line 18, beginning 10 days after filing. This gives transparency to the process that many Minnesotans don't understand and helps us to avoid rate shock in the future as people are aware of what's going on throughout this complex uh, insurance rate setting process. In Section 3, Subdivision 2, we have changes to stop loss provisions. And we move the reinsurance point from $20,000 to $10,000. We also simplify um, the reinsurance point 
and eliminate the need to have a specific number of employees. This gives small employers some flexibility in the plans that they can offer, can help them compete with large employer plans, and perhaps offer more flexible benefit set to their employees. We believe this is a good thing for small businesses across the state. In Section 4, Subdivision 4, we propose for-profit HMOs. Um, members, it has long been discussed that um, we bring in more competition if we remove the nonprofit status requirement for our HMO providers across the state. And for those people uh, who have been left with one provider and limited choices, we hope that we can attract more businesses to Minnesota to offer more products for more people. And uh, one particular particular note that might make members of the body a little uncomfortable, and I pointed this out in a couple of committees, the reference to foreign in this section simply means the business isn't domiciled. It didn't start here in Minnesota. It perhaps is incorporated in Delaware or Wisconsin. And so I wanted to address that right up front so there would be no question. Continuing through our reforms, uh, we deal with transition of care for those people who have lost their coverage because their health plan is no longer offering in the individual market across the state or in a particular geographic area. We are assisting them in specific circumstances for specific conditions to transition from a provider they're comfortable with to a new provider in a new network. And so members, um, if you look at Section 11, starting on page 13, you will find continuity of care and transition provisions. You will see that an enrollee can uh, receive up to 120 days of coverage for particular conditions. These were taken out of statute section 62Q, a longstanding provision. We thought it was good to match that language. So 120 days for acute conditions, life-threatening mental or physical illnesses, pregnancy beyond the first trimester, physical or mental disability with one or more um, major life activities impacted, a disabling or chronic condition in an acute phase, and then a provision that if your doctor believes you're in the last six months of your life, you will have transition then until um, the end of your life. We believe this is a compassionate action that can be taken by this body. We do appropriate $15 million, again, out of the reserves as an acknowledgement that we are in a crisis in healthcare in Minnesota. Article 3, we believe, is an important provision to stabilize the market. Um, it's a reinsurance provision, and as you've heard, if you've been uh, following the committee process this week, Commissioner Rothman raised this as a potential option in October of 2015, and those of us on the Healthcare Financing Task Force have raised it as an issue over the course of the last 18 months or so. Um, we believe that it is a reasonable step to take in stabilizing the market, and we look forward to hearing the governor's provisions with regard to reinsurance. But specifically to this portion of the bill, we uh, develop a governance structure that is uh, that copies the MSHA board that many of us are familiar with. We like to start with something that people are generally comfortable and understand, and we believe that they can provide good governance for a significant insurance provision. Um, members, if you'll look at page 18, you'll see the parameters of this reinsurance pool. If a claim reaches the $70,000 point, 50-50 coinsurance engages until the $250,000 point. That helps give some certainty and comfort to insurance companies as they're developing their rates for their plans that should they have an unusual spike in claims in that very expensive range, that they will have some assistance. But it's important, members, we wanted to, as they say, keep them with skin in the game so that plans providers continue to have motivation to contain costs and limit um, some of the more expensive procedures that might happen if full reinsurance engaged without a 50-50 copay. And let's see. It is funded, members. If you look at the appropriation is on page 21. $150 million 
uh, Commerce has estimated for us that that provides 10 to 12 percent premium relief. As always, we are open to ideas from Commerce as we intend to move this to a conference committee. Um, that $150 million comes out of a general fund appropriation for fiscal year 2018, so that would be impacting our current budget surplus. Along with the reinsurance provision, we will be required to ask for a 1332 waiver from the, the United States Secretary of Human Services. We have appropriated $155,000 to the uh, Commissioner of Commerce to prepare and submit that waiver. And we look forward in an era of reform in Washington, D.C., if they could give us a little flexibility as we try to find solutions for Minnesota. Um, and we know that there is interactivity with our basic health plan, with advanced premium tax credits, and with Minsure. We would ask for um, uh, one of the things that we will need to do is ask for a hold harmless waiver from the federal government, and, and that is a provision that we are looking forward to working on um, as this bill goes forward and we address things with the governor. Article 4 is an innovation that particularly serves those who were hardest hit when insurers pulled out of markets in the state. Um, many farmers depended on Blue Cross individual policies, and so we are specifically addressing um, agricultural cooperatives uh, health plans. This allows agricultural cooperatives, well known across the state, to form a large insurance pool, follow ERISA rules, in offering benefits to their members. It does require that members, that the individual co-ops would join uh, for three years. They would submit funds that would be put into a reserve under a trust, and if they left before the three-year point, they would forfeit those reserves. We need to have a long timeline for this group to form and stabilize, and we think it's important um, that we have those security provisions in place. We are hoping that um, the history of co-ops in the state of Minnesota makes people very confident and that they will trust this provision as uh, a solution for some of the health care challenges and health coverage challenges in greater Minnesota. Um, important to call out, these plans would be subject to federal ERISA law, and that gives them some more flexibility than they might otherwise have. We do have two repealers members. Um, the first repealer is related to the um, for-profit HMO provision in the bill, and then we repeal a pilot program for agricultural health, cooperative, or health plans. And with that, members, I believe I have given an overview of the bill. I am happy to stand for questions. For the discussion, Senator Cohen. Madam President, uh, thank you. Madam President, Senator Benson, uh, th thanks for presenting this bill. Obviously, this is an issue that, uh, as you made very clear, is something that's been in the forefront of, of Minnesota for the last several months. And uh, obviously, you've put a lot of effort into this bill. I wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, obviously, I'll defer to, uh, in terms of uh, minority members, uh, folks like Senator Laurie and Senator Hayden to talk about uh, the substance of the bill. But at the outset, I want to make a couple of comments, uh, and, and in particular direct these comments to, to new members of the body, majority and minority members, because I think there's, there, there's some counterintuitive aspects of this bill. I mean, uh, you know, kind of my joking reference is, uh, but understandably so, that uh, uh, for the first bill, we have a bill that uh, spends $450 million, which I find a little bit surprising. But separate from that, there, there are aspects of the bill, Senator Benson, that I do have some concerns with. Uh, first of all, uh, you transfer in, in Senate File 1 um, monies from the budget reserve uh, of $300 million to the general fund for this purpose. And I'm surprised at the outset that we would use the, the budget reserve. Um, I would first reference members, if you take a look at uh, current statute 160, uh, 16A152, uh, which is uh, uh, the budget reserve section, subdivision 3 use. The use of the budget reserve should be governed by principles based on the full economic cycle rather than the budget cycle. The budget reserve may be used when a negative budgetary balance is projected and when objective measures such as reduced growth in total wages, retail sales, or employment reflect downturns in the state's economy. That's the use of the budget reserve that we've placed in state statute. And obviously, um, <clears throat> this bill does not meet that, that statutory definition. More importantly, 
Minnesota has been recognized as absolutely a national leader in terms of how we've handled our fiscal management. Uh, USA Today recently had a, a survey where Minnesota was uh, second in the country in terms of uh, the fiscal management of our state budget. Uh, more than that, the Moody's uh, 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 budget and ratings agencies, one of the three national ratings agencies, has talked about our budget reserve in their national meetings. Um, not listening just to us brag about our budget reserve, they've talked about Minnesota as being the principal example of how to handle a budget reserve, how to handle fiscal prudence. So to right off the bat, just run against, uh, run counter to what we've uh, been upheld as uh, nationally, I think is a mistake. More than that, if we look at the distribution system, it, it surprises me that we would establish a, a bureaucracy of about, I, I think the commissioner has testified, somewhere around 100 additional employees to distribute these monies and to do so in a process that's going to take upwards of a year. Because what I've heard from folks in my district, what I've heard from folks in other parts of the state is they're looking for this relief today. They're not looking for it months from now after the promulgation of a very significant RFP of a budget process with MMB. Um, an agency is not going to turn around on a dime uh, what the governor has proposed, and we'll hear some discussion about this later, is a system that utilizes the private sector, that utilizes existing systems to get this support and help to those who need it immediately. Why at the front end we would add upwards of 100 people to management and budget uh, to add to that bureaucracy for this uh, uh, proposal and, and, and for this uh, attempt to get the money back to people, I just don't quite understand. Uh, the other comment I would make is just in terms of the process of this place. Uh, the fiscal notes we've, we've seen are preliminary fiscal notes. They're not substantive fiscal notes. That's not an issue that uh, uh, the public is going to respond to, but I think for those of us on the Senate floor, and particularly to new members, we depend on, on substantive fiscal notes for the management of how we handle the promulgation of the state budget. I think the absence of those fiscal notes is a mistake. Uh, I will certainly, in, in defense, Senator Bence, of what you've done will suggest that I don't care who's in the majority, who's in the minority, we've always had fights with the agencies in terms of, of quickly producing fiscal notes. But in this instance, where we have such a bare bones fiscal note, I think it's a little bit of a surprise. Uh, lastly, and this, uh, as, as uh, uh, Madam President and Senator Benson is the former chair of, of the Finance Committee, is a little bit beyond uh, my jurisdiction, but I'm very surprised that we have a bill that initially, uh, from what we hear from the commissioners and, and the tax experts, is a bill that has a tax increase in it. Uh, I don't know why Senator Chamberlain did not request the bill in his committee to take a look at the tax implications, but again, to have an initial bill that, one, adds 100 people to management and budget uh, and the state bureaucracy, and on a temporary basis, uh, two, that has a tax increase uh, at the front end, three, that, that really, I won't say is destructive, I think that's a little bit uh, overreaching, but certainly is a negative relative to how we've handled fiscal prudence in the state, surprises me. Senator Benson, I would hope that maybe as, as uh, work progresses on this bill during the course of this afternoon, that you might consider uh, thinking about some of those issues and trying to accomplish your same purpose, your laudable purpose, but to do it in a way that makes fiscal uh, sense, uh, that makes fisc that, that's fiscally prudent, and something that would match what you want to do, but do it in a better way. And, and thank you, Madam President. Further discussion? Senator Lorry. Uh, Madam P President, I'd like to offer the A16 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. And he's Senator Lorry moves to amend Senate file number one as follows, page 16, delete article three. This is the A16 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Lorry. Uh, Madam President, I, I would like to uh, first offer the A17 amendment to the A16 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Lorry moves to amend the Lorry amendment to Senate file number one as follows, page one after line one, insert. This is the A17 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Lorry. So, Madam President, um, what we have before us is, I'll just describe it briefly and then make a few comments. What we have before us is the governor's um, proposal for immediate premium assistance that has been talked about a great deal. I won't dwell on it. 
Um, it is a bill that I have introduced uh, here in the session this year. It has um, been uh, demonstrated over and over again to be the one that can actually get premium, assist premium assistance out to Minnesota families immediately. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have uh, funded it from the general fund without a transfer from the reserves, and we have eliminated the uh, health care access fund piece of it. And then also, because it also because it really has a 2017 impact, we have included um, the the item from Senate File One, which does the continuity of care for people in a current course of treatment. We think that is a good idea. So it's that 15 million dollars plus the governor's um, proposal for the th uh, 300 million dollar package. You know, if we were to send Senate File One into conference committee off of the floor today. Um, we would have extremely delayed relief for Minnesotans trying to make their um, choices about the insurance product that is right for them and their families and how they access the important care that Minnesotans all across this state receive. It's delayed by two factors. Number one, these additional items in Articles 2, 3, and 4 in Senate File 1 will take significant time to negotiate between the House, the Senate, and the Governor. We don't have the luxury of time. In three days, people need to make their choice if they want um, insurance that is effective for February of 2017. There's already, you know, this is an estimate, but tens of thousands of Minnesotans without insurance today that had insurance two weeks ago. They're waiting for us to act and offer relief for them immediately. By passing a clean bill to the governor that provides that relief, we can get that signed today and they can get insurance that is effective for them in February and stabilize this 2017 marketplace. Uh, you know, one thing that I will um, take note of is that, you know, during the fall, over two and a half months ago, the governor put this out and as we worked, Senator Benson and I, and, and I appreciate all the, um, collaborativeness that, that she and I have had over the years when I was chair and now that she's chair, we continue to talk. And one of the points that was consistently made by Senator Benson is that as we approach this very serious issue, we need to focus on three aspects. Number one is immediate relief. Number two is uh, medium-term relief. And number three is long-term relief. The, immediate, the immediate relief is for 2017 to stabilize that marketplace. If we don't have people buy into the 2017 marketplace, our, our um, uh, uh, solutions for 2018 will be that much more uh, difficult to um, accomplish. So the time that it will take to negotiate out the rest of the terms in Articles 2, 3, and 4 of this bill will delay that relief. The other way that the relief is delayed is by the mechanism incorporated in Article 1 of Senate File 1, where there is an incredibly burdensome eligibility tool that needs to be developed. It would either be uh, an additional 100 or so FTEs in the part of uh, Minnesota Management and Budget, Myron Franz has testified to that, or um, a uh, 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 RFP put out and have a private vendor um, build this system. They wouldn't be able to have the RFP done until sometime in June or July, and the relief would not hit Minnesota families until sometime in 2018. That is not going to help stabilize the 2017 marketplace. We need that immediate relief, and I pledge to work very hard on that uh, medium-term relief to, so that we have 2018 and then also long-term relief for 2019 and beyond. Um, I think that the ag co-op language has a great deal of merit. We've tried to work on that before. I, I think we can get that across the finish line. But I don't think we should allow it to delay the um, premium relief for today. Um, you know, I know there was a, an amendment offered in Health and Human Services for county-based purchasing um, uh, options to try to bring them into the individual market and provide additional options for people, uh, particularly in greater Minnesota. I think that has a great deal of merit, but it's really complicated. One thing that members, you know, will learn as we go is health care is hard. It is really complicated. We are not able to get through these complicated issues 
in time to provide this premium subsidy for Minnesota families. That's what we need to focus on. Um, the, the reinsurance that is in Senate File 1 is another one that I think that we really can come to some meaningful agreement on. It is highly problematic in the way that it is structured in Senate File 1. If we have a 10 percent, you know, uh, Senator Benson testified um, that, we, that, that Commerce is stating that this $150 million for a, this particular version of a reinsurance program might mitigate uh, premiums by 10 or 12 percent. If it mitigated premiums by 10 percent, it would cost us um, uh, nearly $80 million in federal reimbursements for our Minnesota Care program. You know, we are supplanting state dollars for dollars that would otherwise flow from the federal government. There is also a great uh, a 10 percent reduction in the amount of federal revenues that would flow through advanced premium tax credits for people purchasing um, their, their products on the exchange. It is close to dollar for dollar trade-off. We put Minnesota money in, the feds take federal money out. That is not a good deal for the state of Minnesota. The waiver is a, a really good idea to try to get the feds to agree to hold Minnesota harmless for trying to make these fixes, but this should be contingent upon that, and if, if we aren't able to secure such a waiver, then we should um, postpone it. These things take time. We owe it to the people of Minnesota to put this premium subsidy out in a way that they can understand and a way that they can make their choices in the next couple of weeks so that we can stabilize the 2017 marketplace. So, um, Madam President, uh, I, I uh, request a roll call vote and I ask for member support on the A16 amendment as amended by the A17 amendment, which once again is the governor's premium support funded by the general fund, no transfer from the um, the, the reserves plus the, um, what, what the uh, Republicans brought forward in Senate File 1 for continuity of care. I think this is something that we could get done immediately and be very proud and, and then focus on those medium-term um, solutions. And a roll call has been requested, a roll call granted. And just um, just to be to clarify, it is the A-17 that is in, for, in front of us. We have not adopted anything. So we have to adopt A-17 first to the amendment. But further discussion on the amendment. Senator Schoen. Thank you, Madam President. Would Senator Lori yield to a question? Senator Lori will yield. Senator Schoen. Senator Lori, so in this change in the amendment, does this change the premium relief? Uh, my understanding when we were in committees, that premium relief, uh, it, what was going to be an average of $6,000 a year or $500 a month, was actually going to start with checks in 2018. Will this move it from 20? So will families get their, their relief immediately, or will they still have to wait till 2018? Senator Lori. Madam President, Senator Schoen, um, you know, families would get the, they would know what the relief is immediately. This would be uh, managed by the health plans, which would take an, uh, a, an immediate 25% discount on the insurance premiums as soon as they could get that affected. It might be March, it might be April before that was effective, but, uh, but if it was March, the January and the February subsidies would be included in that uh, March. If it were April, it would be the January, the February, the March, and the April would all be um, included and it would be month by month immediate premium relief. Families would not have to wait until 2018 to see the relief that we're proposing today. I will add many, many families are not able to provide the float till 2018 to subsidize, you know, to, to wait for this. Um, in committee, we, we asked the Minnesota Council of Health pa Plans very directly, you know, let's say that, that this version in Senate File 1 was adopted. And um, Minnesota Management and Budget put the, uh, the, the um, mechanisms in place to get this relief to families, and, and it was understood that it wouldn't arrive till January. Would carriers be able to keep people insured if they sent in the 75% of the premiums that were, uh, that, that, that they would, that, that consumers would ultimately be responsible for, and no, the health companies are not going to provide that float. The state would not be able to get this relief into families' pockets in time. 
and we would have a significant destabilization of the individual market in 17. Senator Schoen. Madam President, would Senator Lurie continue to yield? Senator Lurie will yield. Senator Schoen. Madam President, Senator Lurie, under your plan, do families pay in or is it automatically deducted? And that question is, is it off of their premium so they never have to write the check under your uh, amendment as they would under the Senate File 1's version where they actually have to pay for it out of pocket ahead of time and then wait till 2018 to get the relief? Senator Lurie. Madam President, Senator Schoen, it would be taken off of their initial invoice. They would never have to write the check for it in the first place. And through that mechanism, um, you know, one additional really salient point is that through that mechanism, it's able to be considered tax exempt and, you know, to the individual. If we send checks directly to the individual to reimburse them for um, uh, premiums that have already been paid, um, the Minnesota Management and Budget and the Department of Revenue have told us, as well as Senate Council, that um, that would uh, be, it's the, the initial take by all parties, that would be taxable income. And that's a real problem. I mean, if that's what we're going to do, I mean, that should go to tax committee at, at the very least, rather than into conference committee, um, to try to work out those tax implications. Senator Schoen. Thank you, Madam President. Well, I'll just follow up with uh, this, that uh, Senator Benson and I grew up in the same area, and, and Senator Lang now represents that area. And I can tell you that the farm families out there right now, are uh, they just finished paying for seed and fertilizer, and now they're going to be uh, contracting for chemical for ag use. And you know those are in a significant expense. And at $6,000 a year that they're going to have to pay out of pocket and wait till 2018, you're talking about uh, folks that are thinking about, are they going to get new dentures? Are they going to get uh, braces for their kids? And they kind of planned on that, and maybe they could. And if it's not coming out of their pocket, those are things that they can have happen. If your mortgage is $850 a month at $500 a month extra out of your pocket, that's half or, or almost over half of your mortgage payment in greater Minnesota. And I'll tell you right now that this is an issue that affects my families and my district and every point of this state. But in greater Minnesota, in some areas, I hope you'll be able to look back and tell your constituents why you wouldn't support the immediate relief and tell them why they need to wait till 2018. I would highly encourage you to accept Senator Lurie's amendment to get immediate relief today and get it started immediately because writing that check ahead of time, that's pain. And then we're going to tax that income when we give them the relief as well. Let, let Senator Lurie fix it. He's doing the right thing. Senator Lurie? No. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President and Senator Lurie. I appreciate your thoughtful presentation of this amendment. It is disappointing that you would ask us to take out the one thing that we think would have the biggest impact on 2018. Um, we're looking at 2017. We don't want to be short-sighted. Let's keep an eye forward to the future so we don't end up coming back here with the same problem in one year. And so, um, members, um, Senator Lori, could you please yield to the question, um, is there any means testing in this provision? Will Senator Lori yield? Madam President, there is no means testing. Once you go in and start trying to do an income test, that's when you get into the full-blown eligibility uh, mechanism that slows it down and puts the relief out till uh, 2018 and becomes unworkable. I actually uh, prefer the policy of having a means test. In fact, in uh, February of last year, uh, Senator Scoy um, and I sat and worked on a, on a tax relief um, uh, proposal that would uh, provide Minnesota tax uh, relief for individuals ineligible for the advanced premium tax credits, those individuals over 400 percent. So it would be, and it would limit the uh, percent of income that would go to premiums. Um, you know, I think that's a preferable uh, policy outcome, but I don't think we can wait for it to be implemented. I think that um, we need to act now. One of the things, you know, Senator Schoen brought up farm families. You know, the individual market is actually 
uh, largely defined by independent small businesses, by farms, by folks you know, in business for themselves, doing work for themselves. That is a group with a fairly volatile income as well. And so if you try to tie it to income and they have to wait until they're done with 2017, nobody's really going to know what level of premium support they're eligible for. If you have a tiered income, you know, I mean, they're buying seed and fertilizer. They might need a new tractor. They might need, uh, if it's a business, they might need uh, new machines for their business uh, that are deducted. It, it's hard to predict what your income is going to be. This is simple, easy to administer, easy to understand, and will bring people forward to, sub to, to, to provide that stability to the 2017 marketplace that we can then use to go into um, taking a look at uh, 2018 and beyond. And again, um, I, you know, I, I actually find great merit and think we can get these other pieces across the finish line. The, the reinsurance um, is a really complicated provision. I think that we should try to figure out how to do it and make sure that we're held harmless by the feds or find some you know, uh, way to use that investment to stabilize the market beyond that without um, giving up the federal funds. That's going to take time. We don't, Minnesota families don't have the luxury of the time that is proposed in Senate File 1. I, again, uh, members, I'd, I'd uh, urge support for the A-17 amendment. And Senator Benson. Madam Chair, again to the A-17 amendment, I see that there are transfers of data from the health plans and there are some data protections, but one of the big concerns that was raised was the amount of data that would be going back and forth. So that data would have to go to the Department of Commerce for audit purposes. Our provision has a far superior audit provision in that the Office of the Legislative Auditor would be working to ensure program integrity. Um, and Madam President, we have been working with the Commissioner of Management and Budget to try to streamline this as much as possible while allowing means testing, while having program integrity here at the state of Minnesota where we as legislators, as policymakers, can keep an eye on it. And so members, I'm going to ask you to oppose the A17 amendment, even though it does have uh, the transition of care, and I think we have our first point of agreement, and I am grateful for Senator Lori pointing out that we do have significant agreement on that, which was not already originally in the governor's proposal. We have made progress, members, and uh, haven't even gotten all of the governor's ideas. And I would ask that we leave reinsurance in this bill. Again, it's significant, and it has to be moved early in this session, and we look forward to having more ideas brought forward, as Senator Lori said, how do we do this better? The Department of Commerce has been working on this since October of 2015. I'm sure they have ideas, and I look forward to them being brought forward. I would ask members to oppose the A-17. Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, Madam President. Um, and um, would Senator Benson yield for a question? Senator Benson will yield. Senator Hayden. Uh, well, thank you, Madam President. Senator uh, Benson. So uh, in your provision, you really, uh, or you gave the reason that you opposed Senator Lori's uh, uh, amendment is one of the things is the lack of means testing. Uh, Senator Benson, to the question, do you know how many people that you think would receive uh, premium relief that would be over 800% of poverty? Senator Benson. Madam President, the Commissioner of MMB referred to it as several million dollars going to people who made in excess of a million dollars. And so, um, and also there was a governor's provision, I'm sorry, not over a million, uh, made over 800% of the federal poverty guideline. I don't want to mislead the body. Several million dollars worth of relief going to people over 800% of the federal poverty guideline. In our provision, those people would have to apply and ask for the money and um, even if you're at seven, eight hundred percent, if you don't want to apply and ask for the money, you don't get it. You don't receive payments from taxpayers if you don't want them. Under the governor's provision, even people who didn't want the relief would receive the relief. And so I, I think that some method of means testing would make sense. And um, to a conversation Senator Lori brought up earlier, 
uh, he and I have worked on this, and there were some initial calculations done that around $20 million in the governor's provision would go to people who would be eligible for advanced premium tax credits. And so if we don't have any provision to check that, we're spending nearly $20 million on people who are already eligible to receive federal relief. And so I think some means testing is a reasonable step to take with $300 million. Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, Madam President and Senator Benson. So I would continue to kind of yield to see if we had a fiscal note, um, if the, it seems a little bit of a back of the envelope uh, discussion that the uh, Commissioner of Management and Budget said because we haven't had very many fiscal notes for this bill. So I'm not quite sure, members. That is kind of to Senator Cohen's point of the issue of our process and going through and ensuring that we have the information that we need, that we've looked at fiscal notes, that we haven't necessarily guessed to try to figure out how many people would or wouldn't, we'd actually know that. So we'd know that if we had a 15 or $20 million system that we're building to figure out, to, to create a means test that would go away next year, that we'd actually know if there was a return on that value. We would know how many people that we would kind of, that would apply, that we would know that we wouldn't give this subsidy to, because it, what if it's $500,000? What if it's $10 million? What if it was $50 million? The problem, members, is we don't know because we're moving too fast. And to Senator Benson's point about the advanced premium tax credits, which people right now are going to be able to get that if they go, they, they can be eligible for advanced premium tax credits in the exchange today. So there's nothing in Senator Benson's proposal that prevents them from doing that, even with her means test. Uh, provision because that's not part of what she's doing. The point is, members, is this. Minnesotans, we have promised Minnesotans that we would work hard to make sure that we could get them the, the premium subsidies that they need. Senator Schoen talked about it in farm country. Senator Lori has talked about it. We talk about it right here. I have heard professionals that frequent this building every single day that need that relief that can't continue to make that flow. So what happens is we should move forward, get the relief to people that they need today. The provisions that are in the rest of the bill, Senator Benson is the chair of the Health and Human Service Committee here. The Health and Human Finance and Policy Committee, Senator Benson is in charge of. She sets the agenda. That's what you do in the majority. majority. You set the agenda. You walk us through those paces. I'm a member of it. We are prepared, those of us that are on the committee, to walk through this. We haven't suggested that, it, that those are things that we don't want to do or that we might not want to do. We want to have the information. We want to figure out what are the unintended consequences. In this particular case, Senator Benson has joined all of these provisions that, once again, we have not suggested are good or bad because we don't know. We want to get the information. Right? We want to send that bill on to the Finance Committee. Yesterday, we sent the bill on to the Finance Committee, and we didn't have all of the information for Finance Committee members to understand what they were doing. Because some reason, we had to fast track the whole bill. That's not what Minnesotans are asking us to do. They've been asking us since last year to get them the premium relief. They've been saying, listen, I'm not, I don't know if I can afford health insurance unless this gets by, unless someone helps me with this. They're saying, hey, I'm putting this on my credit card, but I sure hope by March or Madam April. Madam President. Senator Benson, for point what purpose of, do you rise? Point of order. Is this to the amendment? Well, uh, yes, it's. Well, absolutely just a moment, to Mr. The Senator Hayden, just a moment. Oh, excuse me, Madam President, uh, Senator Benson. Yes, it absolutely is. It is telling, I'm giving you the rationale as to why Senator Lori's amendment makes a lot of sense. And I'm contrasting that to what you uh, have developed as the bill. So, Senator Benson, Madam President, Mr. Benson, it is to the point, and it is to the amendment. And, so, anyways, uh, and members. Senator Hayden, Senator Hayden, just please try to narrow it to the amendment. We are. We have the A17 in front of us, and um, I'm sure there will be ample, ample opportunity if you 
would like to discuss more later when potentially there's other portions. Well, thank you, Madam President. Unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to discuss this at the length that we want, which is why Senator Gazelka has asked us to bring these things to the floor. But I understand. What I'm telling you, uh, members, uh, obviously, as we uh, start to move forward, is that this is really important to Minnesotans. Um, that most of the things that are in the underlying bill, we have not vetted properly. So please support Senator Lori's amendment. Senator Benson. Um, thank you, Madam President. And I think this might be a good opportunity to remind us how we got here. Um, federal activity forced us to eliminate MSHA, forced us to do a bunch of reforms. And so we're kind of stuck with a mess. Madam President. Senator Hayden, for what point, do you rise? Point of order. State uh, your point of order. Is uh, Senator Benson uh, talking about the amendment or the underlying bill? Um, Madam President, we need subsidies because we have a fundamentally broken insurance market, and Article 1 of the A17 amendment does address the need for subsidies. So I would say I was to the amendment, Madam President, and I apologize. I will restrain my comments. Senator Hayden, you and I have spent a number of hours together over the past several days talking about this bill. I'm sorry you didn't feel you had the opportunity to talk to me about it until today. Um, in any case, I want to address something that this bill does. Um, additionally, this takes money out of our general fund instead of the reserves. And Senator Cohen did bring up that we have good reserve policies, but the governor was ready to spend this money before it was sent to the reserves. And I think there's agreement that it is raining. There are Minnesotans in crisis. And um, I think if basements were flooded, <laughs> I think if roofs had blown off, I think this would have moved a whole lot faster. Somebody would have said, all right, dam broke, flooded the basements, let's fix the dam, let's help people fix their basements. That's what my bill is trying to do. And unfortunately, the A17 amendment doesn't address at all the fundamental problem about how we got here. And our time is short on that as well. So again, I would ask members to oppose the A17. Senator Lurie actually was next. Senator Lurie. Um, Madam President, uh, to some of Senator Benson's comments regarding the, th there are some number of individuals eligible for advanced premium tax credits that would get uh, subsidies instead through uh, the governor's plan, which we're bringing forward here and, and agree with. Um, but to, to that point, I, I hadn't really realized it until Senator Benson called this out. Um, it's one of the reasons we should really have a fiscal note. Category 1 in Senate File 1, as, uh, as presented for people 300 to 400 percent of federal poverty level, it increases the subsidy for them from 25 percent in, the, in, in uh, the A17 amendment to 30 percent. It actually increases the incentive for Minnesotans to take advantage of the state subsidy instead of the federal subsidy. So any reasonable analysis of this, if we could actually get one in the form of a fiscal note, should show that this would actually exacerbate the amount of um, state resources that would go to supplant federal resources. And that's actually a real problem that comes back to, we should take a look at this before um, you know, agreeing to spend state resources in this manner. I think that we should get uh, resources out to Minnesota families in the most um, streamlined and, and easy fashion, easy to understand, easy to administer, able to be there immediately. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Benson is right. It is raining on Minnesotans, the 5% who are uh, part of this individual market. And I don't think those persons want to wait until next January or February to stop the rain and pump out the basements that are flooding. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. I wish to impose a call of the Senate for the remainder of the bill. Senate is under call. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. I move that further proceedings under the call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. 
Those opposed, no. The motion does prevail. Senator Abler. Thank you, Madam President. For the people at home, that wasn't the vote on the passage of the bill. That's another technical thing we're doing. Um, Madam President and members, uh, this is a really important debate. And a lot of us, including me, tried really hard to get a special session to get this worked out. And uh, this, I don't know how long the debate's going to go today, but there's a lot of background, which I'm not going to go into, except to say that I wish this could have got done on November 9th or uh, December 23rd or sometime to get this going. And, but beyond that, this is the bill, members, uh, because the inability to make, come to a decision uh, before the election and just in the weeks after, this is the bill. This is the bill that is going to at some point come back and be the relief bill. And so you can vote however you like, but my interest is to vote to advance a bill that's going to bring relief to Minnesotans. If, if, if the uh, people who are going to choose to vote no prevail, there will be no bill to move forward to help Minnesotans of any sort. And that's important to me. And if, this, if the Article 2 of this bill fails to go forward, which is part of the amendment that's here, we will have less opportunity to draw more plans into Minnesota and give people choices. Currently, we are uh, mostly run by nonprofit HMOs that have as their mission, serving Minnesota in multiple ways, either as group policies or individuals or third-party administrators. And over the course of events, and we can argue, I'm sure we will later, whose fault it was and who did what to whom and what bill was it and what should be repealed or not. But over the course of time, those nonprofit HMOs have actually retrenched their work. They have actually gone out of serving some people in this state, that people are receiving literally no options and they have to take horrible options now. And if art, the point of Article 2 is to bring more plans, more entities into serving Minnesotans. Can, <clears throat> if we allowed for-profits in, would they come? I don't know, but what if they could? Maybe one would. What if we allow co-ops to form an agricultural co-op and, and buy insurance for themselves? Uh, I live in uh, the farming community of Anoka. Well, not exactly, but I've been talking to farmers across Steele County and other places um, that are paying $40,000 for a plan. $40,000, that's maybe half their family income. They are being crushed. This bill gives them some relief for the short term, but if we don't do something to get those other groups into Minnesota and thinking about it now, they will have the same situation next year. That's the point of Article 2. That's why today, that's why those ways to bring in more opportunities for those people, especially in greater Minnesota, are, are necessary. But to the heart of the bill, uh, I read the AARP. Thank you, Senator Lurie. I read the letter. And it's an interesting, they have a sentence in there uh, on page one. It says, well, AARP is generally more supportive of the targeted approach to relief, uh, which this bill provides. They're nervous about the timing. Well, frankly, so am I. But if we ever want to have a chance to make sure the people who have the least ability to withstand these increases and get 30% of our, the rebate, this is the only way it's going to happen. Uh, the 25%, I supported that in, in, uh, in November. I supported it in December. And if that's what we have to settle for, I'll support that. But the only way we can target more to the people in the greatest need who are suffering the most harm, these small businesses on Main Street who are working for just above the, the line where they get a subsidy, and they are the backbone of our communities. The only way is to vote for this. And, and so I know the opinions of the departments. I think uh, I, I commend uh, Commissioner Franz and Commissioner Rothman for their engagement in this process and their work and their best opinion. But those are still their best opinions. Um, we're barred from using Minsure to do uh, 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 verifying of uh, income. Well, is that really how it has to be? Could you think Washington couldn't give us the ability in a short amount of time to use that as a way to check income? We don't know for sure. We'll know in a short time if that's going to be possible or not. But for today, do you think we should give everybody the same amount of money, the same percentage, or should try to help people who really, really are in harm's way? And members, that's the discussion today. Are you going to vote to do something to help somebody? Or are you just going to say no? Are you going to vote to try to get it to people who are in the most dire of circumstances in this horrific time for them? Members, I urge a, a no vote on the amendment and a yes vote on the bill. Thank you.
I have several people on the list, so if it's specifically to that, I could respond. Otherwise, I have Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, uh, Madam President. Will uh, Senator Abler yield for a question? I'm sorry, Senator Abler, you yes. said? Senator Abler, will but, you? Well, Madam President, Senator, Senator Abler, um, I was really listening to what you had to say about all of the various ideas. We all know, and this is a compliment, how creative you are about thinking about these things to help Minnesotans. Um, I remember, Senator Abler, until the question is in the, I think it was Senate File 55 in the Health Care Committee, you offered an amendment that went on that county based purchasers could get the opportunity to take a look or to be involved in offering uh, a, a plan on the individual market. I didn't see that in the bill. Is that in the bill that Senator Benson presented to us? Senator Abler. No. Senator Hayden. Well, well thank you, Madam President. And uh, Senator Abler, do you know why it isn't in the bill? Madam President, point of order. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, point of order is that we're talking about the Lori Amendment, not an amendment that would have been put on in a committee to the rest of the bill. And so I would ask that we redirect the discussion back to the A-17. Senator Pratt, your point is well taken. Please direct your, your information to the A-17 Amendment. Uh, Madam President, to Senator that Lance, point. Senator Lance, for what purpose do you rise? Uh, to that point, Madam President. Point of order? To the point of order, yes. Senator Latz. Uh, line 1.3 of Senator uh, Lori's amendment deletes articles, proposes to delete articles one and two of Senate File One. So it's important for the body to know what's in Senate File One that is proposed to be deleted. Uh, so the questions about what is in the underlying bill is entirely relevant and within the order of this discussion. And I think it's a fair expectation that if an amendment went on in committee and didn't show up later on in the process, we ought to know about that and understand why that's not the case, because it's a grievous breach of Senate procedure and protocol if that's the case. Thank you for the advice, Senator Latz. I will just ask that we direct our comments towards the A-17. That is what is in front of the body. Well, thank you, Madam President. Um, well, I think that I've made my point, but Madam President, I will say, I will say that I've listened to your rulings, I have listened to, uh, I've been uh, uh, asked for a point of order, but other members of the other caucus have talked about the underlying bill since your first ruling. So I just want to make sure, I noticed that with Senator Latch the other day, that he didn't get an opportunity. I just want to ensure that as you make those rulings, that you are being fair. Senator Benson talked about the underlying bill. Senator Abler talked about the underlying bill. It is appropriate for us to talk about the underlying bill. So I want to make sure that as we get up to make our points, to make sure that Minnesotans understand what we are voting for on their behalf, that our caucus does not continue to be interrupted and shut down as we're making uh, our points about the underlying bill. It is far too important for us to know what's happening here than for this to continue to happen to us. Madam President, advice? Senator Pratt, actually, Senator Pratt, if you'd like to move on, I think the Senator Hayden has uh, finished his comments, and if you'd like to move on, you're next on the list, Senator Brett. I'll, I'll take your advice, Madam President. Go ahead, Senator Pratt. Oh, no, you're done? Okay. I th you were on my list, that's all. So, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam President. And, and let me just make a quick uh, clarification is that we're debating the amendment to the bill as it stands, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of discussion about other changes that have happened in committee. Uh, I want to speak specifically to the A-17 amendment, and I think we all agree Minnesota families need relief from the, AC, from the Affordable Care Act of Minsure. In fact, one of the most bipartisan statements I think I've heard our, our governor say is that the Affordable Care Act is no longer affordable. And there is no mandate that we hold payments until 2018. Now, I sat and I listened to Commissioner Franz uh, in Commerce talk about the timing of, of how we could process these payments. And I work in a highly regulated industry. And I've had to turn around these types of, of requests on very short order. And I am confident that we've got smart people in the department that will figure out a workaround 
to turn these payments around to, uh, uh, to uh, insureds uh, in very short order. But I also believe that we've had a long discussion in commerce, a long discussion about stability of the market. And I think that's the key difference between the A-17 and the bill that's being presented. Commissioner uh, Rothman stated that we need premium relief to stabilize the market, and I agree. But premium relief alone won't stabilize this market. We need to have reform so that we can have some certainty going into 2018. The public, or I'm sorry, the, the commissioner has known about this collapse in the individual market for seven months. He knew it back in June, is what he stated in the Commerce Committee. And they've run several, several models on reinsurance, and yet we don't have a single recommendation from the administration on reform. And now we have a deadline coming up in June when insurers have to present their rates for 2018. They're working on that right now. They need to know what this body stands for. Do we stand for just kicking the can down the road and only giving premium relief, or do we really want to stabilize this market, truly stabilize this market, with some modest reform? And so, members, I encourage you to vote down the A17 amendment because it, it only goes halfway to where we need to be. It only goes halfway to really stabilizing a market and giving Minnesota families uh, the, the certainty that they need, not only for this year, but for next year as well. Senator Marty. Madam President, I wanted to respond to two things Senator Abor said. First of all, I, I would love to. I mean, he said how we we'll to make sure the people who most need these, the relief, get the relief. That's a good idea to make happen. But when you're talking about something that's going to cost $20 million to set up a bureaucracy to means test it, for we don't know how many people are over 800% of poverty who it might rule out, it basically means the people you want to help aren't going to get any help for a year. So if you want to help the people, Senator Lori's amendment will help the people. If you want to wait and figure out to make sure nobody's getting something we don't want them to get and we're going to spend $20 million to make it happen, that's what the underlying bill would do. So if you want people to get help, if people, farmers, others need the help now, they're only going to get the help if it can happen quickly. And it's only going to happen through Senator Lori's amendment. And the other portion of it about Article 2, I, I understand what you said, you wanted more people into the market. Somehow, if the goal is to bring down health care costs, I'm not sure that bringing in Anthem and Aetna and all the national for-profit insurance companies to take their profit out on top of it is going to bring down the rates. I do not believe bringing them into Minnesota is going to be a plus. And you can argue that we can't. We should argue those issues, but we should argue them not in an urgency where we have to put this thing together, no fiscal note or no complete fiscal note. We're going to do all this now because it's so urgent we have to do it. And if we pass this, it's not going to happen anyway unless we put on Senator Lori's amendment. So I argue both taking out Article 2 is important and also Article 1 doesn't work the way it is here. That's the simple fact. I'd rather do it with the means testing too, but it doesn't work. We've heard that. Nobody has an idea how to make it happen. Of course, they will bring in 100 new employees, $20 million to administer a one-year, one-time program. That just doesn't make sense because it's not going to help. Further discussion, Senator Lorry. Uh, thank you, Madam President. To, se to Senator Pratt's uh, comments, uh, mostly directed at the reinsurance product. Um, you know, I said it during my initial remarks, which got a little lengthier than I had intended, but I, I think maybe a piece of that was missing was missed. I actually do think that the idea of reinsurance is a really valuable idea that we likely can bring across the finish line. It's also a really complicated idea. It is going to take some significant time to figure out the reinsurance model that actually works for Minnesota. The one that is before us today, we put Minnesota dollars in, to our health care system to try to stabilize it, 
and nearly dollar for dollar, those dollars are taken out of our health care system by the feds. Okay? That's not going to work to bring stability to the Minnesota marketplace. We need a reinsurance model that makes sure that we get a hold harmless through a waiver or some other mechanism so that we don't lose to the feds every single dollar that we put in. And I commit to the body today to work hard on the reforms uh, to stabilize the individual market and small group market in, uh, reforms as well if, if, uh, if we can work some of those out. There are things that we can agree to. They are complicated. They take time. They need to be done right. If we send this in and take the time to actually understand and make the right decisions on these really complicated models, this premium support will not get to families in time for them to be able to be active in the 2017 marketplace. And we will have that degradation, that additional degradation that has already occurred that makes 2018 that much farther out of reach. So I don't think we're in that much disagreement about the needs for some of these um, important uh, 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 ideas that are brought forward in Senate File 1. I think we need to be more deliberative, find the, um, the analysis, be more certain about what they're going to do, how they're going to work, and uh, bring those forward. And I pledge to, to work collaboratively with my uh, friends and colleagues across the aisle as we move forward. But it should not be used to delay immediate relief to families all across Minnesota. Further discussion on the A-17 amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the role on the A-17 amendment. All senators voting who have desired to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. We now have in front of us the A-16. Madam President. Senator Lorry. Um, I, I will withdraw the A-16 amendment. I don't think that's an additional expenditure in time that's necessary at this point. Thank you much. The, uh, the, um, a-16 amendment has been withdrawn. We now have in front of us the underlying bill, Senate File 1, further discussion. Senator Schoen. Thank you, Madam President. Well, it's too bad that we didn't adopt that amendment because I'll tell you what, when you go to uh, small towns all over the state of Minnesota and you think about the $500 a month on average that we expect that this to come out of their pockets, and if you go to All Mix Grocery Store in Clare City, Minnesota, and you think about the families that are going to be able to not have that, those funds to be able to support their local stores. You go to DeGraff Bar and Grill. It's the one thing in town in DeGraff, Minnesota, that those families, if they had an extra $500 a month right now and not have to wait till 2018, would be a great deal. Downtown Spicer, Minnesota has several fun places. It's recreational, but they have an all year. People have to be there all year round to support those businesses, too. And I, this is a bill that's not going to help local businesses. We're going to tax Minnesotans by uh, provide. We're going to tax their relief when they have what they already have to pay out of pocket in premium insurance. When it comes back, they're going to get taxed on it. So we just raised taxes on Minnesotans too. This is an unfortunate situation. I, I, I highly hope uh, we reconsider this and you vote no. And uh, let's do the right thing. Further discussion, Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Madam President and members. Well, Senator Benson, in her initial remarks, said that uh, pe people would have to choose between their health care premiums and their mortgage under the current system, and her bill is intended to prevent that. But the fact is they will still have to choose between their health care premiums and their mortgages for at least the next year. 
because as Senator Schoen indicated, people are going to have to make the payments now. They're going to pay $500 more a month for that health care insurance, on average a full $6,000 for the upcoming year until they get their premium refund from the state with this new bureaucracy uh, next January or sometime in 2018. I refer back to uh, Senator Benson's earlier comments that it's raining now. Now, this is her explanation for taking the money out of the reserves. And if it is raining, people don't want to wait six, nine, 12 months for the rain to stop and to pump out their basements or in Minnesota with heavy snow to prevent their roofs from collapsing. They want that relief now. They need that relief now. There are people who are putting their premiums on their credit cards hoping that can, they can get by another month or two and then their premium reductions will come through and they can afford to pay for health insurance. But in March, when they don't have the cash flow and they don't have the credit, rating, the credit left on their credit cards, they're going to have to make that choice. And there are people who are going to go bare with no health insurance rather than pay the premium because they don't have the money. They frankly flat out don't have the money in the bank to make that premium payment. It doesn't do any good for the legislature to tell them, wait until January, we'll send you a check then. Because by then, they'll have gone six or nine or 12 months without health care coverage. That's not what they sent us here to St. Paul to do. They sent us here to give them immediate relief. Now, why that wait? Because of this means testing provision that's in Senate File 1. And I also am not necessarily opposed to means testing. I think it may be a very worthwhile approach to this because not everyone needs the immediate relief. But the majority can't even tell us, Senator Benson can't even tell us how much money is going to be saved by means testing. So we're being asked to spend $20 million or so to implement a program that we have no idea if it's even going to save us $10 million. It may save us $5 million. It may save us $23 million. I think Senator Benson said that she was informed by MMB that there would be several million dollars saved, which tells us that the proposal for means testing right now is simply half-baked because MMB hasn't even been given the opportunity to come up with a detailed fiscal note to let us know what the benefit is going to be from this cost of $20 million. And if she adds in the initial calculation, she said $20 million in advanced premium tax credits. Okay, so several million plus 20 million, maybe 23 million to spend $20 million to save $23 million and delay the relief for a whole year to accomplish almost nothing? Where's the advantage to that? And for Senator Abler to suggest that this is the only train out of the station, well, members, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. 34 members of this body just voted to delay premium relief for a year for Minnesotans who need that premium relief right now. And if this is the only train out of the station, members, well, that's only going to be because the majority of this body refuses to allow another train to come out of the station. You know, I've served in this body for long enough to know that claims that this is the last chance don't really carry much weight because there are always other opportunities to bring forth more bills, longer legislative process. You can be down to 15 minutes left before constitutional adjournment deadline, and there's still time to find another vehicle out of the station uh, to, to make the relief happen or to pass your bill. So if this is the last train out of the station, that's the choice of the majority in this body uh, that will not allow another vehicle to come along. So we really have to ask, what's the rush? What's the rush on all this other insurance market changes? We don't have decent fiscal notes. We hardly had any time in Commerce Committee for the stakeholders to make presentations. So you've got major changes to the insurance market that are proposed as a part of Senate File 1. 
for-profit insurance companies coming in after decades and decades of nonprofit only. It's been a consensus in Minnesota for years that we should have a nonprofit health insurance market. Now this major change to the market is being proposed with barely a few hours of consideration by the Senate Commerce Committee in the second week of our legislative session. That's not something that's necessary to stabilize the market for 2017. It's not. We have plenty of time in the next few months, as we have done for year over year over year, to hear complicated, complex, challenging proposals with many stakeholders. And for those of you who have been through the process before, you understand even from committee to committee to committee, bills change because stakeholders come up with ideas and suggestions and problems and wrinkles that need to be ironed out. And sometimes it takes a few days or a few weeks for that process to happen. And by the end of the process, the bill, the outcome is stronger because of having gone through that lengthy, detailed, considerate, deliberate process. We always end up with a better product because of the process that we have here. Truncating that process, compressing it into one day of hearings in multiple parts and multiple committees where there's not even time to consider ambiguities, complications between committee stops, it's a terrible way to make policy. And we can talk about the for-profit market, we can talk about the reinsurance issues, we can talk about all of the other changes that are contained in Article 2, many of which have merit and which deserve a full airing before uh, the Senate in all of its deliberate process, which aren't getting that airing, that consideration now. The people of Minnesota didn't send us here to act quickly without really thinking things through. Democracy is messy and slow, but there's a reason why. There's not a premium on efficiency in the democratic process. There's a premium on outcomes that will work as best we can forecast them to work, that have time for the input from the public, for the citizens uh, to, to participate in the process. And that doesn't happen here on the Senate floor. That happens in the committee process. We couldn't even get testifiers from one side of the Capitol complex to the other side of the Capitol complex fast enough to be able to testify in the House and in the Senate, because while the Senate was having rushed multiple hearings, the House was doing the same thing. So how many of your constituents were prevented from participating in the legislative process who couldn't testify in their only opportunity in the committee hearings because they were on the other side of the complex testifying in front of the House. And do you really want to go home to your constituents and tell them that the first time, for those of you who are new to this body, the first time that you had a serious, complicated, complex, far-reaching initiative before this body, that there simply wasn't time for your constituents to be heard on it? Really? Did you even have enough time to read the emails that you've gotten on this topic and respond to them? Or to make phone calls and reply to the calls that you've received? There just isn't enough time to deal with it, members, in this rushed a process. And there's no need to do it. Because the only thing that's absolutely urgent is the premium relief. And Senate File 1 that we're about to take a vote on won't even provide that for another year. Will, uh, will Senator Jensen yield to a question? Uh, Senator Jensen has stepped off the floor. Well, will Senator Utke yield to a question? Did I pronounce that properly? Senator, Senator Utke will Utke. yield. Senator Latz. Thank you. Uh, Madam President and uh, Senator Utke, uh, do your constituents in Park Rapids and other parts of your district, do they want premium relief now or in a year? Senator Atke. Oh, sorry about that. Um, they, they're interested in premium relief and they're interested in premium reform. 
Thank you. Senator Latz. Well, Madam President, uh, Senator Utke, uh, do you think they could wait a couple of months for premium reform? Say Madam President. Senator Utke. Madam President, um, you know, they've waited a number of years, and I guess they're, they're waiting for our reactions, and yes, they would. Uh, Senator Madam, Latz. Madam President, uh, uh, I would agree. They can wait a couple months for premium reform or for health care market reform, but they can't wait for the premium relief that they need right now if they don't have the money to pay for their insurance premiums. Uh, Madam President, will uh, Senator Eichhorn yield to a question? Senator Eichhorn will yield. Senator Latz. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Eichhorn, uh, do your constituents in, in Grand Rapids and throughout the rest of your district, do they want to have the premium relief now, or do they want to finance the delay in this uh, out of their own pocket and get their premium relief in about a year? Senator Eichhorn. Madam President, uh, my, the, the constituents of my district do not want um, this without some reforms that come with it. It's very important to them as well. Otherwise, next year we're in this exact same spot. My constituents would also like to see reform along with the relief. Thank you. Senator Latz. So, Madam President, uh, Senator Eichhorn, you think your constituents who don't have the money to pay health care premiums right now don't have that extra $500 in their bank account. You think they'd rather wait for reforms somewhere down the road um, and, and go without health insurance until those reforms can have the impact you hope they'll have? Senator Acorn. Madam President, the constituents in my district would like to see reforms along with the relief. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Acorn, do you think that your constituents want to pay taxes on that premium relief as well? Senator Acorn. Madam President, again, my constituents would like to see the relief as well as the reforms. Senator Latz. Well, Madam President, I appreciate the, uh, the clarity of that answer. Is, uh, uh, is, Sen is Senator Jensen back on the floor now listening to the discussion? Yes, he is. Uh, will Senator Jensen yield for a question? Senator Jensen will yield. Senator Latz. Thank you. Senator Jensen, uh, you're a doctor, so you see patients um, who, many of whom I presume are covered by health insurance, um, and uh, I would expect that many of them would struggle if they didn't have health insurance coverage, and some of them struggle even to pay the insurance premiums so they can come receive your services. Do you think that your constituents would prefer to have the financial relief of premium assistance uh, immediately, or would they prefer to wait a year be and get a refund after they've paid out an additional $6,000? Um, out of their bank accounts, if in fact they have it. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Senator Latz. I don't have to wonder what my patients think. I see 5,000 people every year, and they're telling me. And what they've said is, please, when you go down there, Doc, no more Band-Aids. You've got to fix the problem. We've gone from one crisis to another. My patients have said, we know what undone looks like. That's what happened last session. And that's what happened from June to December. We want to see something done. This is a chance to get something done. Relief needs to be attached to reform. And reform needs to deal with access. And that's why this bill should be passed out of the Senate to the conference committee. But you're absolutely right. My patients want relief. They want reform. They'd like it in the best form possible. And the conference committee can probably deliver that. But your question's a good one. Madam President. Senator Latz. Um, uh, Senator Jensen, under the Senate File 1, the best information that we have from MMB is that they're not going to see any relief for about 12 months under this bill. Uh, and uh, I support changes in the health care system, too. Um, I just don't see that it needs to be done today. It can be done in two weeks or in four weeks. We have a whole legislative session uh, to make that happen. Uh, and uh, so I don't understand what the rush is, uh, Madam President and members. Um, there's plenty of time to have a good, thorough, deliberative process and allow our constituents to participate and allow all the stakeholders to participate uh, in this uh, without setting up a temporary, expensive bureaucracy 
without, as Senate File 1 will do, causing our constituents, when they do get relief, to have to pay taxes on it as income. So here, here, the, the ultimate irony, right? The proposal is to give them relief so they can pay for their health insurance, but they're going to have to pay their health insurance first, get relief later, and get less relief because it'll be taxable income under Senate File 1. Uh, Madam President, the bill before us is just not ready. In fact, it's really harmful uh, to Minnesotans across the state. Uh, there's time to do it right. We had an opportunity with Senator Lorry's amendments to do it right. They've been on the table essentially since October. There's already the delay. People have already had to front their premiums for January and at this rate for February as well because the majority refused to decouple long-term significant reform in the market from the immediate relief that our people are waiting for. That's why we're in this position now. So you can't claim there's an urgency when you claim when you're creating the urgency in part by your own actions. We should get the relief to our constituents, to our people now, and then focus our time and attention on doing reform, change in the markets, stabilization of the markets the right way. And, and I do have a, a list of people who do want to speak, but Senator Jensen, if you have something, because you want to respond directly to uh, uh, the questions that um, Senator Latz was asking. Madam President, thank you. Senator Latz. I find it curious that you're so concerned about getting the relief now when over the last seven months you haven't done anything. We're talking about people, we're talking about families of four, which are 400 percent basically above the uh, federal poverty guideline. In, in the bill that we're talking about, we're basically talking about people who make over $100,000 a year is, is basically the crunch point, and there are some rate cliffs in this. Do I think that they want to have this relief right now and the heck with the, uh, the solution? I don't think so. I think they want us to fix this. We're not talking, we've got people from a families of four from 25,000 to 100,000. They're covered through MA, MinCare, and the exchange. I think people are sick and tired of band aids, and this bill addresses all three pieces of this three legged stool. It's relief, it's reform, and it's access. And it's not perfect, but I'm not going to stand here and let better be the enemy of good and do nothing. And, and Senator Jensen, I didn't want to interrupt you, but it, you really do need to face the President when you speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam President. Senator Latz. Uh, in response, Madam President, we don't even know what better looks like yet because we've only had a few hours of hearings on the proposals for better. And I understand Senator Jensen wants to, to get here and make an immediate impact and go back right away and say, yeah, we got the job done. Uh, but those of us who've been around the process for a while understand the process to do it right takes some time. It takes some time. Now, the legislature hasn't been in session in seven months. Governor wanted to call a special session um, in November, wanted to call it in December, but the GOP insisted on a massive package of reforms accompanying the relief. So I agree, there ought to be changes in, in the, uh, the system. And there's plenty of time to do that yet without rushing through the process now. I'm going to move Point on to the list. Madam Senator Limmer. Madam President, I couldn't help but listen, but I think we're beginning to, uh, due to the last comments, start to get into implying motives regarding who, who and how a vote is cast. And uh, I would suggest that the body, or, or that you, Madam President, uh, give, us, give us appropriate instruction when it comes to implying motive, which is a violation of Senate rules. And, and Senator Limmer, thank you for pointing that out. I, would just, I will just ask the body to direct its comments towards Senate File 1 and stay away from motives and personalities. And we are going to move on. And I'm going to call on Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I've had, I had a bill a few years ago that had a request for an appropriation of a roughly $10,000. And I couldn't get a hearing in the Finance Committee until we got a fiscal note. 
This bill is, I know maybe the bigger bills we ought to have fiscal notes. This one's $450 million. That's roughly 45,000 times as much money as my little bill was appropriated. And I understand when there's urgencies, but you know, this isn't, most of this stuff isn't anything to do with the premium relief. Last night in finance, there was an amendment that took the EMCHA program, the reinsurance program that people have said they liked. EMCHA was funded out of insurance companies who were assessed their share of it for the insurance policies. That's what was in the bill until last night, and it changed. It decided to appropriate $150 million out of the state treasury last night. How many people in here knew that? I'm not sure everybody did. Senator Abler did. I'm glad he knew that. He also had a provision he put in the bill which disappeared. But my point is that if this is urgent, it doesn't mean we shouldn't find out what things are costing. Again, if it's going to spend estimated 20 million, 6.7% of the amount we're putting out just to set up a bureaucracy, not for ongoing program, but for a one-time rebate, $20 million for that is a big chunk. And I highly doubt we're going to save $20 million from that by cutting off $20 million of payments to some people. So we got to be rational in how we do it. And actually having a fiscal note that says those things might make some sense. But like that reinsurance program, people say they want reform now. I'm not sure that's some of the things in here are reform. I'm not sure for-profit insurance companies from around the country coming into Minnesota is going to bring down costs. I don't think that's reform. I think it's the opposite of that. But just take the the reinsurance program, that $150 million doesn't come in this bill, doesn't come out of the state treasury until next year. Not this fiscal year, next year. So why do we have to do that now when it hasn't been vetted? When just last night, not this bill has been in, was introduced a week ago or so, and that's very quickly, but last night we added $150 million, we switched who would pay that $150 million. We're not going to wait to figure it out. We can't wait when we're not even going to spend that money for another six, seven months. We can't get the money for six or seven months. It's from next fiscal year. So if these things are so urgent, if the rest, if the premium relief is so urgent, why don't we take those things out and debate them through the process where we ought to do it? Not rush it through without fiscal notes, which is a no-no. Both parties have said, and I think that's been true, Leadership of Finance Committee under both parties has been very clear, you don't do that. And again, this isn't a $10,000 bill. This is a $450 million bill. $150 million came last night, out of the blue. So if we want to get people something quickly, which is why we're racing this through the process, the one thing that everybody says we need to do quickly, the premium relief, isn't going to be quickly under this bill. Senator Lori had an alternative that would have happened quickly, but this version will not happen quickly. So we're putting all this other stuff in there. And I understand some of you really want this other stuff. You want the for-profit insurance companies. You want the other stuff. That's OK. Let's debate that. Let's have the hearings. But let's not just put it into a bill that we're racing through the process with no fiscal notes so we can get relief out quickly, and then the practice we set up is going to take it a year to get out anyway. I urge you to vote against the bill and come back in a couple of days with a better version. And the list is getting longer, but may I remind you again, a gentle reminder, the remarks should be made to the president. I know I'm getting you know, hand signals, text messages, so please, <laughs> you save me a lot if you just address your remarks to the president and then I don't have to keep reminding you all. So I have Senator Hayden next on the list. Well, thank you, uh, Madam President. I want to make sure I'm looking at the president when I uh, speak. Uh, I think that we uh, find a trend here in, in our remarks about this bill. I think that we uh, all agree that their premium relief needs to happen around the state. 
Uh, I think that in a series of questions that Senator Latz had to some of our newer members, that their communities uh, and the people that they talk to and their patients want uh, premium relief. Um, I don't think that anybody disagrees that we don't want to look for the opportunity of reforms and take a look at what are the things in which we need to do for reforms. What I do think that we have, Madam President, is an idea of the process in which we went through this is not the process in which we are accustomed to in this body. Especially from the sense of if we just take just a little bit of time, and I know that members' stomachs are probably growling and thinking about the things that they need to do today and their constituents are backing up, but if we take a look at this, Senate File 1 is what we're talking about today. But Senate File 1 was split into Senate File 5. 55, uh, 55, 55, and 56. And that was done for expedience sake, if I uh, heard Senator Benson right, that we needed to run these concurrently. We didn't need to. Typically what we do is we take this bill and we go from one committee, uh, it gets amended or vetted, it goes to the next committee, the public gets to weigh in, and we build that. And we saw that in a series of questions that I asked Senator Abler, in which an amendment that he put on in the committee, member of the majority party, put on around county-based purchasing, somehow, and there was a promise, that these bills would all come together in Senator Rosen and the Finance Committee, and somehow it was left out. So I want to be careful here because I know that we're, it's our first lengthy debate and we don't want to impugn the integrity of the members of Senator Limmer get up uh, when things look like it might be going that way. The president has told us to play nice in the sandbox, if you will. But the problem is that the process has not been followed. The promises of even the process of this bill has not been made. I know it might sound ironic to members that I'm taking up for someone in the other body, but I think that that was also an important notion to take a look at, the county-based purchasing side of this issue. But what that gets us to, Madam President, is the idea of that's why we need to take our time with this bill. And so to the new members here on both sides of the aisle, we're not telling saying we're gonna wait till next year. What we mean is we haven't even gotten to the point to establish our deadlines. And what that means, because I know I didn't know what it meant when I first got around here, is there's deadlines in which we have to get our work done. There is a schedule that the secretary will kind of lay out for us, or the president or the majority body will say, here's when you need to get your work done, here's when policy needs to be done, here's when we know when your bills that are spending money needs to get done, et cetera, and you'll learn that. But we haven't even got a chance to teach you that. We haven't even got a chance to explain that because we're moving so fast on these issues. We will get an opportunity, uh, or we would have, or we should, get an opportunity to talk about what those ideas were. Senator Lori or Senator Marty talked about the reinsurance provision. When we heard it in healthcare, it was going to be a, men, uh, a mincha model. It was going to, to, to be the old model or some version of that where we went to their board and we assessed small businesses. And then the next day, that's the one that I heard, but the next day I'm not on the finance committee and there's an appropriation for that. Right? We didn't get a real chance. We heard a little bit from the chamber and small business that says they don't know if they like that. But that, that opportunity for our members to, to hear that throughout the committee process, we didn't get to hear that. It changed from day to day to day. Now we say, well, if we pass this bill, it will go into conference committee. Well, the last time that I looked, uh, not the full body gets to be in a conference committee. As a matter of fact, typically, those who vote for the bill and a subset of those who vote for the bill get the opportunity to be in a conference committee, right? Those typically are, maybe there's a new member, but typically those are the people that are the experts that sit and try to reconcile the bill and come to some agreement with the administration. That means that a lot of us members won't be there. So the problem with this is we haven't had the opportunity to weigh in. These are substantial issues. I'm with Senator Marty. I'm not sure that bringing in for-profit insurers is the right thing to do, but I'm willing to listen. But, but we have to have the process in which to do so. Today, the for-profit insurance companies have gotten out of the individual market. 
So I'm not sure of the logic that says that somehow that's going to increase competition, which is going to make insurance premiums lower. I don't follow that logic today, but maybe there's someone through the committee's process that will, that will assure me that that's what's going to happen. But I haven't been afforded that opportunity. So that means all of us who come here, who are representing our constituents, we don't get that opportunity. So Madam President and members, the reason, and I want to be really clear, that I don't think that we should vote for this bill is that it doesn't do what the authors said that it should do. It doesn't get the premium relief to people today. I've been working on this bill, we've been working on these ideas since last session when many of you members weren't here. We have multiple provisions to look at this issue. I was a member of the Senate Bipartisan Conference Committee. We have members of both members of the caucus on that. We brought those issues forward and the House did not want to hear it. They simply said, we don't want to look at those issues. That's the truth. They said, we simply just want to get rid of Obamacare, that's it, that's all. We want to abolish Minsure or clog it up, that's it, that's all. And then over the summer after we adjourned, we started to get the bad news that Senator Benson talked about. That insurers were moving out of the market, the blues were leaving, the others were threatening to not offer it. The administration started to scramble and cobble together a plan in which they thought could at least offer some support for those in the individual market, and then we started to work on it. A subgroup of us bipartisanly and bicamerally came together to work on this issue. Several meetings. The last time we were in the state office building, we had a kind of a, a, a person's, a gentle person's, women's, men's, if you will, agreement that we were going to move forward, and then the issue, it got attached to the other special session issues and never happened. So we had some agreement without necessarily these reforms and had somewhat agreed, and I don't want to put anything in anyone's mouth, but had agreed that we would deal with the reform issues as the session came forward. We had an agreement, a handshake, if you will, without the handshake. So we kept moving this process. So I want to make sure the record knows that we have, for those members that are new, that have been working hard at their jobs, that have been seeing their patients and working in their insurance companies before they got to the legislature and wasn't paying attention every step of the way because that wasn't their job at the time, we have been working on those issues. We've consistently been working on those issues. And to no avail, we could not get this in front of this legislature until now. And now we're running a speedy path. And if we can't, so essentially what I'm hearing is that if we can't get these ideas that are unvetted, untested, these initiatives that we don't know what to do, that the administration is writing on the back of the envelope trying to figure out what it would cost. If we can't get those things done, then we don't want to give the premium relief to our patients because, by God, they sent us here to get things done and not to kick the can down the road. Well, I would suggest that we need to patch the roof, right? That's what we're using today, right now. We need to stop the water from getting in. And then we need to figure out the underlying condition on if our gutters are leaking or if we need to build a dam or whatever other analogy, right? I was talking to Senator Champion, storms will come, but can you stand the rain? That's a new addition reference for those who you know it. But anyways, I like to have a, just a little bit of fun, Madam President. But here's the point. We should not vote for this bill. We should think about the work that we've done, the amendment that Senator Lori has put forward. Let's get the relief to the folks today. Let's go through our thoughtful process. Let's figure out what are the kinds of issues, initiatives, and ideas that we have that will start to do, that will start to plan out for the future to ensure that the market, let's look at the unintended consequences. Senator Lori has done a good job, and I, know, and I trust in, uh, Senator Benson is extremely thorough. We've served together many years now in this body. I know that we will get through, but we have to look at the unintended consequences. We have to figure out what the federal reimbursement mechanism is. We shouldn't send a letter to Washington hoping and wishing and praying that they let us off. We should ensure that that happens. And I don't know what happens these days when you send a letter to Washington. I don't think anybody does. But we should ensure that these things will happen so that we don't make things worse for next year. That would be the worst possible outcome and consequences. So members, I want us to be thorough. I want us to be clear. 
I think that there is a level of patience that won't last until next year. I want us to pay attention. You got, we got our first taste of evening committees. I think we need to go every single evening. I know members are looking at me now if we need to do so in order to figure this out. So once again, Madam President, addressing the President, uh, we should not vote uh, for this bill. We should allow the bodies and members of this committee to fully, of the community, of our stakeholders, to make sure that they, we can fully vet these proposals to ensure that they're the right thing to do. And furthermore, we should come up with other ideas. There was no way in which there was no opportunity for us to come up with other creative ideas that other members may have, that other community members may come to us that may also help that. So once again, I will, Madam President, uh, ask the members uh, to vote no. Uh, this is not the bill that's going to do what you think it's going to do. May I suggest that we go to third reading before um, we, we have a long list and I would um, if there's if there are there's no plans for further amendments, I would just uh, ask the secretary to. I don't see any objections, so I'll say that the secretary will give the bill the third reading. Senate file number one, third reading. And now I will continue with my list. Um, uh, and she stepped out. Um, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, uh, I think you are hearing from members in our caucus that we absolutely agree that we do need to take a look at some of the longer-term solutions. That is without a doubt. Uh, in fact, some of the ideas in the bill being offered by Senator Benson are quite similar to ideas that were offered uh, by uh, Democrats last year reinsurance, you know, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we were seeing if we could combine um, small and, and group business. Uh, we had a number of ideas last year to Senator Hayden's point. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to explore um, more in alternative creative ideas. Some are, are, are similar, like I said, some would be different, uh, and yet we have this process that's being, uh, frankly, abused. Uh, to, the, to the earlier point that Senator Latz made. Uh, we had testifiers who couldn't even get from one hearing to the next or one side of the Capitol complex to the other because uh, we see this uh, steamroll uh, going through. Transparency and review and rate setting was an idea. Something like that is reflected in this bill. Uh, changing our enrollment periods, uh, changing the boundaries of the, of the rating areas. Uh, expanding Minnesota care so more Minnesotans could access what has been a very, very successful program. Uh, and we also offered tax credits. All those ideas were shut down, by the way, uh, last year by the other party. Um, now we see them revived and, and, and being rammed through in a rush. Why were those ideas offered last year and discussed to some degree? Um, this was easy to anticipate. We saw this coming down the pike at us. We had some difficulty and issues with the small individual market last year. Uh, we saw the congressional Republicans shut down the risk corridor payments. Marco Rubio bragged about that in his effort uh, to become the president. That was simply an effort to spread risk wider while companies in this initial three-year startup phase were, were uh, grappling with this new market the individual small market. It was incorrectly characterized as a bailout and use of tax money. Neither of those statements were correct. This denied $250 million from our insurance market and those who were uh, uh, trying to provide this, these insurance products uh, to those folks who had opted for the individual small market. We knew this was coming down the pike, and this was so long as we're talking about the federal government, blaming the federal government for causing us to get rid of MCHA and putting, that in, putting those folks into the, into the small individual group market, I submit that this problem was a creation of the zeal on the part of congressional Republicans to dismantle Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, at all costs. And the cost is extremely high and we need to deliver the relief to my constituents today. They have the opportunity to make a decision about whether or not to opt for insurance so they can become covered again in February. Many of them 
have simply gone without. You heard from one of my constituents at the hearings. I have heard from dozens of them. These are hardworking individuals, small business owners, some with very, very active teenagers in high-risk sports, and they're telling their teenagers, you don't get to do your sports this year because the risk is too great for you to get injured, and we're not going to have insurance this year. We can do this today and deliver that relief so they can make a decision versus telling them, oh, you're just going to have to wait a year. We have some other things to think about. We want to debate and discuss, and we're going to move this bill uh, in such a way that we have to create a whole new bureaucracy and figure out uh, all kinds of different things, and you're not going to even know what you get until 2018. So they're going to decide not to have insurance for a full year where they could make a decision the next few days to sign up for health care and be reinsured once again in February. It doesn't make any sense to me that we simply can't take the governor's plan, take the amendment that Senator Lorry proposed, get the relief into people's pockets immediately, and then work on all of these possibly and probably very good ideas, especially the ones that are similar to the ones we offered last year, and take the time to consider those. The two are not mutually exclusive. I don't understand why we can't do this for Minnesotans. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to thank all the members that have worked on this bill and on other um, relief ideas over the interim. I know Senator Laurie has spent a lot of time on it, Senator Hayden, and Senator Benson. Um, and I would uh, like to know if Senator Benson would yield to a question. Senator Benson will yield. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, Madam President. I'm not on any of the committees that have heard this, but I did uh, listen to some of the testimony on TV, and I understand several people here have mentioned that this premium assistant is taxable. I heard Commissioner Fran say that they believe it is taxable income. Um, Senator Benson, have you requested a revenue note, and do you know how much revenue this will raise? Senator Benson. Madam President, there is no revenue note for this provision. Um, it's my understanding that many disaster relief provisions are not taxable. Senator Dietzik. Um, will Senator Benson yield for a follow-up question? She will yield, Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, Madam President. Can you tell me where this is defined and how this is defined as disaster relief assistance? Where is that in statute or in IRS code or in case law? Oh, I apologize. Benson, I probably shouldn't have said disaster, although sometimes it feels like it. But it is a crisis, and I think it would fit under a definition of general welfare, which is the uh, definition that uh, the commissioner, when we were working on this in the interim, uh, was going to use as a provision. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Do you have any, again, any rulings from the IRS or any case law or any, any place in the bill or in statute that would say and show where this is, um, I forget the terminology used, welfare benefit assistance, as opposed to taxable income? Senator Benson. Madam President, I do not. Uh, moving on, Senator Little. Well, thank you, Madam President. I don't think I'll have any uh, issues following the rules of looking forward since I have really no one else to look at. Um, so in the last few weeks that I've been here, I've been seeking advice from a lot of the senior members of the Senate here from both sides of the aisle, and I'm not going to name names. Um, but the overwhelming theme that I heard is that our biggest job here is to figure out what we can agree on and work on that. And I kind of feel like the folks that told me that aren't necessarily adhering to that today because we have agreement. We have agreement that relief should get to people, premium relief should get to people as soon as possible. Uh, we even have agreement, it seems, on the amount of relief. Um, so I think agreement on, on big issues here is rare, and we should uh, take that opportunity to find a way uh, to pass just that. Um, because that's what we're here to do, is find the places we agree, and we agree people need relief right now. Uh, but I do want to talk about my district and, and how this, this bill would affect them. Um, as many of you know, my, my district is very conservative, politically conservative. Uh, they overwhelmingly voted for our 
uh, President-elect Donald Trump. Uh, they overwhelmingly voted for uh, Jason Lewis. Uh, and then they voted for me. And uh, every day I'm here, I, I can't figure out how I got here. Um, but maybe this, uh, my last few comments will explain how I got here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be in the, in the district tomorrow, as many of you will, will be, and I'll be talking to people about this bill, because that's what they're gonna be asking about. I'm gonna tell them about a bill that spends $450 million. I'm gonna tell them about a bill that has $150 million that is uh, pretty much unvetted in terms of its return on investment. I'm gonna tell them about a bill where the relief may be taxable and may increase their tax liability. Um, I'm gonna tell them about a bill that adds to the size of government, maybe up to an, uh, 100 employees, just for a short-term program. Um, and all this pushed through with much discussion, and, and I guarantee you my constituents are gonna ask me uh, what liberal Democrat is pushing that bill. And so I wanna to appeal to your conservative principles uh, of fiscal responsibility and, and seeking a return on investment on the bills you pass. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Madam President. This thing's pretty loud. Uh, I just wanted to address the body. I think it's interesting the conversations we're having, what we're hearing. Uh, we're steamrolling it. It's being pushed through without being vetted. It's not getting to all the proper committees. Testifiers aren't able to testify. I find that very interesting. Uh, the reason I find that very interesting is in Commerce, we were the first ones to hear Senate File 1. So we have a Commerce Committee meeting from 10.30 till noon. Close to noon, we had two testifiers that had not testified had not signed up to testify, but were requested, but, but committee members requested to have them testify, which I did appreciate. So I think we did the right thing. What we decided to do is recess and come back later on at the call of the chair so that these two testifiers could testify and people on the committee could ask questions. But lo and behold, guess what happens? Not everybody comes back to the committee. So I thought it was quite interesting that we have these uh, complaints about people not being able to be, to get, uh, vet the bill, not being able to hear the testifiers. In Commerce Committee, we heard every testifier that wanted to testify. Everybody had an opportunity to ask questions. But it's hard to ask questions or listen to the people that are presenting as testifiers. It's hard for them to do that if they're not at a committee meeting. So if we're gonna talk about vetting bills and being fair about being, having bills heard, then I would appreciate that the people who wanna do that show up at the meetings to get it done. Senator Lane. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I would like to speak to the premium relief part of this bill, the most urgent part, and make four points here and as it relates to my constituent, Deb. Uh, she's in the individual market and her premiums have doubled. This is very concerning for her and she is waiting, hoping, praying for premium relief. Uh, and so number one, in this bill, relief will not happen soon. It could be 2018 before she would receive any relief. In the governor's bill, this is not the case. Point number two, any re uh, rebate will, will most likely be taxable, something no one expected. The state will lower your premiums, but oh, by the way, you're gonna have to pay tax on that difference. Not so in the governor's bill. Point number three, promises are being made to some in this market that won't be met because on line 433, individuals in category three may get relief if there's enough money in the bill. Without a fiscal note, we don't know what it's gonna cost. We don't know how many people will actually be covered. And point number four, taxpayers are funding a $15 million infrastructure set up for one year to get this job done, verify eligibility, get the checks out, which brings me back to point number one. Deb is not going to see relief and she is likely going to have to quit her health insurance, which is very worrisome to her with her health needs. So this bill is not what we need. The governor is much more appropriate. Please vote no on this. Senator Jensen. Madam President, thank you. I think we're getting a little distracted here. 
Most of us ran for the last 18 months, not on the issue of a $300 million subsidy, not on the issue of a 67% rate increase. We ran on a problem with health care. We were supposed to go in and fix the problem. That's what I heard when I was at the parades, when I was doing the door knocking, was you got to go down and fix the problem, Doc. I haven't heard about this from dozens of patients like some of the other senators have. I've heard of, about this from thousands of patients for the last five years. Two days ago, I had a patient in who had just been booted off a minsure. And he has cirrhosis, hepatitis C, liver cancer, and kidney disease. And he doesn't know how he possibly is going to stay alive for the next six months while he's still hoping to get a transplant. I think we need to stay focused on the fact that this whole crisis about the relief is a relatively new phenomenon that came up the last couple of months. Now, it's, it's for sure that we knew there were problems for much longer than this, and I agree with those points being made. But the concept of $300 million being needed to use the subsidy, that's a relatively new one. Madam President, I would ask if Senator Little would yield to a question. Senator Little will yield. Senator Jensen. Senator Little, when you're in your district tomorrow and you're talking about what we talked about today, how are you going to talk or speak to the issue that you supported an approach that would provide a family of four that makes a half a million dollars to conceivably receive a larger subsidy than the family of four that makes $100,000. Because the bill that you're supporting provides a 25% rebate based on the premium you pay. So if someone at 100000 chooses a lower level pay, uh, plan and someone with more money pays a higher level plan, Mathematically, we will have potentially the greatest subsidies given to the people with the most money. How would you respond? Senator Little. Madam President and Senator Jensen, I think it's important to remember that when we're making policy, we're not just making policy for one individual theoretical uh, person, right? We're making a policy for an entire state. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is there's people that, aren't, that don't fit that description that need it now. And so that's how I'm going to explain it to my constituents, and I, and I think they will accept that uh, explanation with open arms. Thank you. Senator Johnson. Madam, Madam President, thank you, Senator Little. I appreciate your, your candor. I said earlier, Madam President, I think there's, we've already seen what undone looks like. This is a chance for us to look at what done looks like. We're perched on a hill here in St. Paul, ready to make a decision, and we can start to put the building blocks in place. Yesterday's chaplain spoke about Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes says there's a time for every season. This is a time to build up. And to build up, we need to deal with relief. We need to deal with reform. We need to deal with access. This bill is not perfect. But this bill provides the ingredients for us to move forward and fix the problem and also get relief. I don't think the urgency is to specifically get checks into people's hands, whether it's three months, six months, or nine months. If we don't elevate the problem to the level of our interest and all we do is just throw money at it, that's just a Band-Aid. And that's not what I'm hearing from my patients. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Westrom. Madam President, uh, members, uh, those listening in the audience, uh, the public, uh, I urge your vote yes on Senate File 1, and it's Senate File 1 for a reason. A reason because we've got a health care crisis across Minnesota, across the Twin Cities, but across rural Minnesota as well, where I come from. Eight counties in western Minnesota that have seen the same problem everyone else in the state has. Let me just uh, share an email from Darlene, Douglas County, that I was reading yesterday. Her and her husband uh, planned ahead, had good jobs, worked hard, were able to retire early in life. We're paying uh, 7000 some a year for their insurance before Obamacare came in, the Affordable Care Act. 
Over the period of the Obamacare changes and what was pushed through in this state of Minnesota, they are now facing over $20,000 of premiums. And she said, please do something to change this and please help us with some temporary payments. But this is not sustainable. And so members, we have got to address the whole problem for Darlene. Patrick, another constituent of mine in Traverse County, writes in, excited because he's just gotten a job good enough so he can get off MA. But he says, I am frustrated because Minsure is not working for me. I've spent two hours for the last three days trying to get through on this, and I can't get the form filled out because it's not working. Something has to change. Folks, this is not working, and that's why this is urgent to do now. Get this bill off the Senate floor, get relief out to the constituents, but get it off the Senate floor so we can go to conference committee and get this first step done of unraveling Minsure and fixing the health care debacle that's happened here in the state of Minnesota. Now I'm hearing uh, senators on the DFL side say, let's just send the money out and fix it later. Folks, where I come from, I come from a farm. We used to bale a lot of hay. On those hay racks, we'd get flat tires from time to time. Sometimes you're in a hurry, so you just uh, air those tires up, hope they don't go flat again. Members, we have got a flat tire in our health care system, and the Democrats just want to add air, and you know what will happen. It will be flat again next year, and the same citizens I just talked about and the same citizens and constituents you represented will have the same problems a year from now. It is important to put air, not just air in the tire, but fix the tire. You've got to fix the tire rather than just put air in the tire. And so we need to pass this bill and reform and also offer relief to those that are suffering under this Minsure and Obamacare that didn't work out. The Affordable Care Act better should be called the Unaffordable Care Act. And folks, we need to deal with that crisis right now. Senator Eakin. Thank you, Madam President and uh, members. And um, uh, I do also come from a, a farm myself. I come from a family of farmers uh, in the district that I represent in greater Minnesota uh, uh, has a disproportionate number of people who are affected by this because we have a larger number of people in greater Minnesota who are in the individual market. More people in that area in greater Minnesota that are self-employed, that are farmers. And so it hits us even harder in our area as a result. And I, I say I come from a family of farmers. I have family members who are being affected by this, adversely affected by this. I have, as well as friends and neighbors, who are suffering from the uh, significant increases in the premiums here and uh, the difficulty in finding coverage. So this is something that I feel very strongly about. And I'm for reform. I agree uh, with Senator Westrom and others that we need to have reform. Um, but there's an urgency to the relief uh, that necessitates immediate action. And the concern that I have is that even if this bill was to be signed today into law, the relief wouldn't come until next year. So in, in my view, um, and, and then it's been referred to that that, that uh, money would be taxed. Um, so this is not the emergency funding that we need to provide immediate relief to those who are suffering right now. Uh, what Senator Lorry had offered as an amendment does provide urgent relief, and we need to come back with a bill that does that. Um, I'm not supporting this bill because, and, and the fact is, I don't see this, this isn't a vote against reform. This is a vote against delay. We need urgent action. We need, a reform bill. we need a reform bill as well, but we need urgent relief right now. And I would say that as far as reform is concerned, we want to make sure that we do the reform right, but we want to make sure we do the relief now. Thank you. Senator Lorry. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. You know, we've heard quite a few comments about the process here, and I, I need to comment on that just briefly because the process is really deeply flawed that we find ourselves in today. I trust the work of committees a tremendous amount. I've invested tremendous time, talent, and passion to being an active member, be I in the majority or the minority. Uh, I've had, you know, a, a, a few years in each. We went through committees without even knowing what this bill did. To say that we're going to fix it up in conference committee is absolutely unacceptable. Conference committee is either three or five members from each body that get together, and, and it's not nearly the public process with the input that our whole expertise of, of our committees bring to the table. That is incredibly valuable work that's done. We didn't know when we heard this in HHS finance that the reinsurance uh, plan would reduce um, our federal revenues for our Minnesota Care program by $90 million if it does what it purports to do by um, reducing uh, insurance premiums by 12 percent. Reducing insurance premiums by 12 percent would be a good thing, but losing uh, over $90 million of federal money to support Minnesota Care is uh, really not a wise use of our state dollars. Now, we heard, um, and so what we need to do is make sure that we subsidize this market, stabilize it for 17 so that we have a better platform to move into 18 and fix it right and respect the work of our committees. We can do this quickly. I have every confidence that we can work in a bipartisan manner once we get this uh, stabilization package out the door for 2017. You know, um, well, and, and I'll just say, you know, uh, my wife actually just texted me. She's been watching, and, and we, we still run a, a small farm, and, and farms have been mentioned several times and putting up the hay and whatnot, and she said, you know, it's going to be 20 below uh, tonight up at our farm. Our cows can't wait for the hay. You know, I mean, we've got to get the hay out to them and make sure that, that they're able to have what they need to maintain uh, through these tough times. You know, we can work on infrastructure and things like that, you know, once it, it gets up towards freezing a little bit at least, something like that, and move forward. But we, people need this premium relief now so that they can make the right decisions for their people, uh, for their families and themselves, for the health care as they move forward. Now, several members were asked if their constituents um, were interested in relief now or interested in relief a year from now? And, and the answer was pretty consistent that, well, they want relief, but they're demanding that it be coupled with reforms. Well, you know, we have a letter I passed out from the um, uh, AARP, um, uh, uh, an organization that members are really familiar with. It represents over 10% of our population, 660,000 people. Um, that's a big deal. Well. They're saying, you know, the number one thing is how quickly we can get this relief out. And, and I should say, people in AARP are some of the most burdened because we have three rating factors remaining. Region, everybody's familiar with region. Uh, where you live, it can be priced differently. Age is the second one. Smoking um, uh, status is the third one. But the age rating allows for people um, in their early 60s to be charged three times the premiums of people uh, near their 20s. This is particularly burdensome for our elderly across Minnesota. And these folks are trying to make decisions today, and they need help. And, um, and, and that really the timeliness is the number one factor for the relief. And so, uh, Madam President, I'm going to vote against this bill that delays that relief and hope that we can get together again soon and start to work toward uh, the immediate fix and then work on a bipartisan basis, which I'm certain that we can do, to put some underlying reforms behind the individual and small group market to provide additional stability into the future years. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Madam President. You know, um, I've been listening to this debate pretty closely, and I've heard a real lot of stuff about hay for the cows, air for the tires, no water in the basement. You know, I have absolutely no idea what that has to do with health care. And the people in my district are not coming up to me and saying, you know what, 
I don't have any hay for the cows, or I don't have any air for the tires, or I don't have water in my basement. They didn't, nobody mentioned that to me. You know what they said? They said, my premiums are rising. My co-pays and my deductibles are going up. We need relief right now. I can't afford health insurance today if you guys don't give me some money back you know, on my premiums and on my, on my co-pays and on my deductibles. I didn't hear anything about cows, anything about air in the tire, anything about water in the basement, but I heard a real lot about premiums going up, and I heard a real lot about I can't afford it, and I need relief now. And that's why we got to do relief now. Fixing the system now is not a good idea because who knows what the heck they're going to do out in Washington. And by the time something comes out of Washington, we put a fix in now that then we got to change in a year or two years. And if we don't give relief now, the people who are facing these huge premiums, who are facing these huge deductibles, are talking about not even getting insurance. And that's why we need relief right now. That's why this bill needs to be changed, and that's why this, we have to give the relief up front and not wait for a year or two, and that's why reforms can wait until we find out exactly what we're dealing with from the federal level. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. Well, what I hear from my constituents is number one, the immediate relief, no question. However, they're absolutely terrified at the thought that they're gonna be in the same spot next year. And so they say yes to immediate relief, that's re but they're equally terrified at the thought that we would not make these reforms and thus be in the same situation next year. This is only a down payment on the future. But my goodness sakes, certainly these things, the reinsurance and other things, these are not new concepts or new ideas. So it is time, is an opportunity. And they're absolutely terrified at the thought that this would be a one-time issue and we'll be here again next year. We can't do that to these people again. This is the time to vote for this bill. This is the time to do it now. And members, I urge you to vote yes. Preparing to start wrap up, Senator Bach. Well, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'm, I'm troubled by a couple things. Uh, back in 2014, after managing more than a decade of deficits, and it was tough. Uh, and in that decade, we did all kinds of things in these odd-numbered years when we came in here to try and build a new two-year state budget. We borrowed from K-12 schools. We delayed tax refunds. We unallotted previous appropriations. We sold the tobacco settlement from the 90s. We had 20 years of payments coming in, about $80 million a year from the tobacco settlements of the 90s, and we sold the revenue stream to get less than half the money up front immediately to try to keep the state's budget in balance. It was called securitization of the tobacco revenue. There was every kind of accounting gimmick that you could ever imagine and things you couldn't even imagine used to keep the state's budget in balance. And as a result of all of that, when we finally got the state's budget back in balance, the Senate, all by themselves, in the federal conformity bill in 2014, put in a provision that said, in future November budget forecasts, if there is a surplus, a third of it is going to go to the state's budget reserve, so that we don't find ourselves in the next recession borrowing from our schools, delaying tax refunds, and all those things we had to do during that decade of deficit management in order to keep the state's budget in balance. And Senator Skoy, who chaired the Tax Committee, and I were pretty proud of that provision. And we learned soon that the bond houses out east were talking about it. Moody's and Fitch and Standard and Poor's were talking about what, what Minnesota had done to build a reserve to bridge future recessions. It was a historic thing that other states haven't done. And members, we are in one of the longest economic recoveries, recoveries in the history of this country since the 2009 recession. We are closer to the next recession than we are away from the last one. It will come again, and revenues will turn down. That is the whole point of the budget reserve. 
And what is the first vote this legislature is going to take? With a $1.4 billion surplus, you're going to steal $300 million from the budget reserve that is there for the real rainy day when revenues fall short and the budget forecast doesn't have enough money. The first vote, and especially you new members, the first vote you're going to take is to take money out of the state's budget reserve because apparently a $1.4 billion surplus is not enough to put your budget together. That is a significant mistake. So Senator Betson, as this bill moves through the process and you get into conference, there are other ways to pay for this bill. And Senator Lorry's option of using part of the budget surplus seems reasonable. You could go to the Health Care Access Fund. There's over $500 million sitting there. It's going to be a billion this time next year. That money's collected for health care. That's what it's for. Uh, you could sit the health plans down in conference committee and ask them. They have billions of dollars of reserves. And much of it is based on the book of business they do with the state. Just maybe they might be willing to help us through this difficult situation we're in with this individual market. There are other options available to pay for this. So Senator Benson, as you get into conference, uh, and maybe the House is going to think the Senate bill is so great they're going to send it right on to the governor. But I'm, a, I'm hoping that there's a conference committee so that uh, this issue especially can get resolved. And then my second concern on the bill is relative to, and other people have touched on it, the fact that this benefit is going to be considered taxable by the Department of Revenue and the IRS. That is a significant problem. And in tax speak, and many of you know, uh, I've spent a long, long time on the tax committee here in the Senate and in the other body. We call that an income tax interaction in the tax committee. And so about 300, of the $300 million that we're going to appropriate to pay this, about $100 million of it or more is going to come back to us, either back to the federal government or back to the state through federal or state income taxes. When your constituents find out, when they finally get this money in 2018, that they, it is taxable income, they are not going to be very happy about that, I can tell you that. Now, so I guess I would like to know if Senator Chamberlain would yield for a question. Senator, Chamber Senator Chamberlain will yield, Senator Bach. S Senator Chamberlain, at any point in the process here, did you uh, send a note to Senator Benson or one of the committees asking for the bill to be re-referred to the tax committee? Senator Chamberlain. Madam President, Senator Bach, no. Well, Senator Bach. Madam President, Senator Chamberlain, just a little bit of advice, you can take it or not take it. But during my experience here, we had, when I chaired taxes, I think I had probably eight uh, spending committees, finance committees we call them, and they all love to spend money. And oftentimes, when they're spending money on things like this, there is an impact on income taxes, or there is an impact on property taxes. And when that is the case in a bill, so this is just my advice, Senator Chamberlain, have your staff comb these bills going through finance and being included in the omnibus bills. And where there are interactions with tax policy, ask for those bills, send a letter to the committee chair, ask for those bills to be referred to the tax committee so that we all know what the real impacts are on state revenue and on our taxpayers and on our potential property taxes. So uh, that's just my request, uh, Senator Chamberlain. I think all tax chairs uh, long before me did that. It's a way, uh, it's a way to kind of keep a lid on what some of the spending committees are doing so they're not uh, impacting uh, the revenue that your committee has to drive in order to pay for all of the spending in all of these divisions. But Madam President, I think the fact that there is a, sig a significant income tax interaction uh, with this bill. Uh, Senator Chamberlain didn't ask for it. Uh, I do think it needs to be heard in the tax committee. Uh, it went through a very expedited process going through all the committees. 
So, Madam President, uh, I would move that the bill be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes and ask for a roll call vote. Madam President. Mr. Uh, Senator Chamberlain. Is it appropriate uh, for advice? Well, uh, and, and Senator Chamberlain, I was just going to, we're, we're trying to um, determine if the motion is appropriate after third reading. So, I, I, you know what, we will take advice if you, if at least some, if you have it <laughs> on that issue. Uh, <laughs> Madam President, thank you. Members. Um, this is not necessarily a tax, Minnesota state tax issue. Every time we do something in this body, it could impact your taxable income. So we, we have this uh, uh, bill in front of us with this particular uh, section to it. Will it create a taxable um, event for Minnesotans? Unknown. That's just simply it. In any event, Madam President and members, that taxable event is not state tax policy. It does not have to come to the tax committee. If you raise the minimum wage, for instance, that creates a taxable event federally and state. But that does not have to come through the tax committee. So one, just because it creates a taxable event for federal or state purposes does not mean it comes to our committee. If your income goes up, if we get a raise, that's a taxable event. It changes your tax status. So just because it's a taxable event doesn't mean it comes to the tax committee. Secondly, um, it's whether or not it's, it is a taxable event to the federal level, that is simply unknown. So I recommend that uh, this not be re-referred. We do not need to hear it in tax committee. Thank you. Further advice, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Two things, Madam President. Um, I would suggest that this body is able to act on, on Senator Bach's motion. If you look at Rule 32 under motion to re-refer or to refer, 
It clearly states a bill or resolution may be referred to, to committee at any time before its passage. That's the language. I think the motion is appropriate. Secondly, we had testimony from Commissioner Franz, who runs MMB. Clearly said in their analysis, and after they dug into this issue, that because under this, uh, under Senate File 1, that a person would receive money directly from a state agency after they've paid 100% of the premium, and because it would be going directly to a person, then it would be taxable. In fact, why this is so important to me, because I raised the issue at the Finance Committee hearing yesterday. I asked whether the information is taxable, whether the monies would be taxable, and he clearly said yes. They even checked with all the other necessary bodies in order to uh, be, be clear of that. So for a person to suggest that um, it may not be taxable because there's a special provision. I heard Senator Benson speak to that issue, but she was, unfortunately was in error based on the testimony that we received from the commissioner yesterday who clearly said this would not fall under the exception. So it is clear that it being taxable income raises revenue. And because it raises revenue, it should be referred to the tax committee. So Senator Bach, in his wisdom and also in his uh, ability to read, as we all are, under number 32, a, 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 a motion to refer. If you want to see the page number, it's page 21. It may be referred at any time. Thank you so much, Madam President, for the opportunity to give you advice. And, and I appreciate um, the advice, and we are going to move forward with the motion. And um, so the debate, the motion is in front of us to re-refer to the tax committee. Senator Chamberlain. Yes, Madam President, just to uh, repeat um, again, we do things in this body all the time to create taxable events on Minnesotans. That does not mean it has to come to tax committee, else we would be uh, hearing bills 24 hours a day for the entire session. So uh, I say vote no on the request to re refer to tax. It's not necessary. We don't need to see it. Thank you. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, um, it, it's rather unusual, I think, for a committee chair to say that even though something may come within that committee's jurisdiction, uh, they simply don't need to see it because lots of things come within their jurisdiction during the course of the legislative session. Um, I served as chair of the Judiciary Committee for four years, um, and when things came within our jurisdiction, although there were on rare occasions when uh, we decided it, it was questionable whether it was within our jurisdiction, we didn't need to see it. Uh, when something clearly does fall within the committee's jurisdiction, I think it's incumbent upon the process uh, for the uh, process to be served properly and for that matter to be considered by the tax committee uh, whose members were sent there by the constituents for purposes of analyzing tax impact um, of bills that have tax implications. Uh, we should vote in favor of this motion. Further discussion to the motion to re-refer. Senator Senjum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to reaffirm, I believe, what uh, Senator Chamberlain has said. Uh, this is not new tax policy. It, it is existing tax policy. The tax committee doesn't need to, to meet and talk about existing tax policy. Uh, we talk about changes in tax policy, but not existing tax policy. So I say accept what it is. It already exists. It's on the books. It's been affirmed by Senate counsel and others. Uh, so there is no reason to, to adjourn to uh, or at least recess to, uh, to take this to the tax committee. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, uh, roll call was requested. The secretary will take the roll on the motion to re-refer to taxes.
friend here and said, you should re-refer to taxes, and then you did. Awesome. <laughs> I came here to, that was my job. This That's good, everybody has their job. It's not going well, though. It's, early, oh, it's tied, man. Yeah. Could be getting there. I'll count to 34. Until someone said you can't be here. Is everybody here? Until someone can't be here. Yeah. All those voting, all those senators voting who have desired to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 nays, the motion does not prevail. Continuing on with wrap up, Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Madam President and members. Uh, a spirited debate uh, with some of the uh, political posturing that is uh, welcomed and important in this uh, body. Uh, but in the end, I'm hoping that we all keep our eye on the ball here, uh, that this is very, very important. I've heard, I haven't heard one person in here say that this isn't important and this isn't urgent. And so as we look to do what we're trying to accomplish, I just want to reflect, reflect briefly on, on how we got here and why we are doing what we're doing. And just reflect back about six years about where Minnesota stood in the nation with how we delivered health care and health care insurance. We took care of the needy. We took care of those just above that level. If you were uninsurable, you could get insurance in Minnesota. And we had a, a vibrant market for the rest of us. And it worked really, really well. And there was a shift, and it was only one party shifting a different direction. And I say that not to be partisan here, to make, but to make a point beyond that. There wasn't any Republicans that voted for it. And very few of our amendments were embraced. And so we knew that it was going to be a train wreck. But I say that to say that if we're moving forward to move away from that, it cannot be all Republicans. That may be the vote today, but it cannot be us doing one direction. And so my commitment is that we're going to continue to reach out to the other side no matter what. You have some brilliant, I call them bright bulbs. So Senator Laurie, if I say that, it's a compliment. But uh, this is very complex, as a number of us have talked about. And the moment we're at right now is very, very serious. And we talk about providing that relief, and, and we are committed to that as soon as possible, and I mean like we should be doing it by the end of this month. It is that premium relief, and we're going to figure that out. I cannot imagine that our government would take over a year to reimburse people when if we had a new tax, they'd want it ASAP. So I'm sorry, but I think they can do it. But we're going to have that conversation in conference committee. And if they make the case and they lay out the details and our conference committee comes to that place, then we'll just have to make a decision then. And we're going to look at each of the pieces that we put forth with the governor and some people have asked, well, why, just the, why not just do the money now? And I had a great analogy about a tornado and insurance, and then Senator Tomasoni went off and undercut me, so I decided I'll just leave that one alone. And I live next to a farm, if that helps. But, uh, but I want to be honest and say it was frustrating over the last four years when we, on my side of the aisle, presented many things that we thought could have made it better that were not adopted. And so there is a level of trust that we don't have that we want to have. And, and I have met with the governor a number of times, and I am building a relationship that we can have a handshake and say, I believe you about where we need to go. But part of that for me and for my side of the aisle is you have to show us that you're going to embrace at least some of our reforms if we really expect to do the heavy lift down the road. I don't, this is, you know, Senator Abler rightly said we don't want to miss this opportunity because if we don't do this one, it's not the only train, but if you stop the first train, how are we going to get anywhere? And, and I expect us to be reforming this for a number of years. 
We've been talking about even pre-Obamacare that there's things we need to fix. And so we've been given that task. We're all going to be here four years. We have two doctors that came into our mix that I'm, I'm thrilled with that because this is serious stuff. And I hope they meet and I hope they give us ideas about how to improve this. So I don't want to forget where we were and I don't want to forget how we get to the future. And in the end, some of it has got to be bipartisan. And so we're reaching out to you on the other side of the aisle. Embrace the fact that we are trying to move forward here as fast as we can. The last thing I'll say is we chose the committee process instead of doing it even faster because Senator Bach and I both agreed we want to have hearings, we want to vet it out, and trying to balance that against the urgency of this situation because it is, all of us say it's urgent. And so as we move forward, uh, just know that this is, this is really the first step. And I hope that we have some other key steps this session and then expect more beyond that. Thank you. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President, for the privilege of closing out today. Um, kind of a high point for me, Senator Tomasoni spoke on my bill longer than I think he spoke on his own bill last year. So thank you, Senator Tomasoni. A um, couple more um, sort of metaphors to help Senator Tomasoni. A morphine shot while not addressing the underlying cancer is one that I've heard. Uh, Band-Aid solution, another one that I've heard for moving um, moving payments without some reform. And so I'm trying to address both of those issues in this bill as quickly as we can. Um, we identified four problems, premium, cre premium increases, sudden loss of coverage, uncertainty and instability in the market, and a lack of options for greater Minnesota. We worked to get action on those items in this bill because we think they're important to act on quickly so that we can help with 2017 and impact 2018 because it takes a long time to build an insurance product or to build a co-op. And we need to send those signals early in this session, members. Um, Senator Lori referenced what would happen with our federal dollars if we help Minnesotans. Think about how broken our system must be is if our efforts to help Minnesotans actually force the federal government to punish us for helping Minnesotans. This is how much work there is ahead of us. And as we talk about work that has been done and work that needs to be done, I need to thank, frankly, I need to thank the members and staff of the Human Services Committee, both partisan and nonpartisan, the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee. Um, Tuesday was one heck of a week. So um, thank you all for your help this week. We addressed 17, 2017. We look forward to 2018. Um, I believe we will do good work in the conference committee. I look forward to the ideas that Commissioner Rothman has been working on since October of 2015. I look forward to the reinsurance that has been talked about as having been offered last year to come forward as an idea so that we can put it up against what the House offers and see what the governor will embrace as we go forward. We're going to keep moving because Premium relief is important for Minnesotans, and a stable insurance market is foundational in our economy. The other provisions in this bill, the small businesses, will get more options so that they can help their employees with insurance. Farmers get alternatives that meet their needs if the individual market cannot. And so I must say, I look forward, with your help today, to passing Senate File 1. And I look forward to working with members on both sides of the aisle, in both bodies, and when the opportunity arises to work with and listen to the governor and the ideas that he wants for reform going forward. So thank you, members. I would appreciate a yes vote on Senate File 1. Secretary will take the roll on Senate File 1.
all those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 31 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.